Good evening. I'd like to call to order the Twin Falls City Council meeting for Monday, April 10th. Uh, the first item is the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. So I'd like to invite our uh, Boy Scouts, I think maybe there were a couple of Cub Scouts thrown in there too, uh, to come forward and uh, lead us in the pledge. For those of you wishing to join us, please stand. you boys all go sit down if you would please swing by the microphone over here at the podium tell us who you are which troop you're with uh, and if you're here working on one of your merit badges this evening please and which one uh, I'm Caleb Gorley uh, we're with troop 4 and we're here to speak about the refugee center okay great thank you I'm Ethan Sumption and I uh, we're yeah we're also here for the <laughs> refugee center so and I'm working on my Eagle project for to build a bike shed for the Refugee Center. Thank you. I'm Steven Thewson, and we're here for the Refugee Center, and we're with Troop 4. So. Thank you. I'm, I'm Colby Gorley, and I'm with Troop 4, and we're here for the Refugee Center. I'm Kyler Western, and I'm here with Troop 4 for the Refugee Center. I'm Porter St. Clair, and I'm here for the Refugee Center. I'm I'm Asher Gert from Troop 4, and I'm here for the Refugee Center. I'm Blake Crandall from Troop 4, here for the Refugee Center. I'm Colton Ward from Troop 4, here for the refu yeah, Refugee Center. <laughs> I'm Logan Pitter, um Troop 4, here for the Refugee Center. I'm Crew Peterson here from Troop 4, for the Refugee Center. Great. Thank you very much. I uh, would like to call the meeting to order. We do have a quorum of the council. All seven members are here this evening. And Mr. Rothweiler, are there any amendments to the agenda this evening? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, there are no amendments this evening. Thank you. We have no proclamations this evening. So next is uh, general public input. So if, you're, if you would like to address the council on an item that is not on this evening's agenda, and now is an opportunity to come forward and speak about that. Um, otherwise, we will have an opportunity for uh, public input following uh, the first item on the agenda, which is the welcoming city uh, presentation. So if there's anyone wishing to address the council on an item uh, not on the agenda, you may please come forward. Mr. Edwards. <clears throat> I would remind everyone for the uh, public input session uh, to uh, please approach the microphone on the podium, uh, state your name and address, and whether you're a resident or property owner in the city, and then proceed with your input. Uh, and we're going to limit that to three minutes per person this evening. My Mr. Edwards. Terry Edwards. I live in Jerome. I have property in Twin Falls, and I'm here about the Safe City Proclamation. If everybody hasn't gotten one of these and like to have them, I would be more glad to give it to you. The Safe City Proclamation is a proclamation that uh, treats everybody equally in the state, in the city, and state, in the county, in our country. Uh, I presented this to the City Council last Monday and to yet haven't heard anything about uh, whether or not they're receptive to this or not. So what I'd like to do is I'd like you all to read it, and if you don't have one, I'd like to uh, make sure you get one. I don't want to take the time to read it to each, of, each one of you, but you can go back online and read the uh, uh, or view the video from previous City Council meeting. It will be in there, the presentation. What I'm concerned about is that by, by putting people in different categories instead of all residents, citizens, what we're doing is we're setting aside precedent. We're setting aside precedent that everybody is created equal and has equal rights. Now, the, my concern was the, about the sanctuary city, and I know this is not termed a sanctuary city, but it's surprising to me that we have a scout troop here that are in favor of the refugee center and I don't know that they know a whole lot about it so we mr. Edwards if you want to speak about the welcoming resolution that's on the agenda coming up okay, and you're welcome okay, to speak well, on that okay so I'll, this is for I'll, items not on I'll, the agenda I'll do that also thank you uh, 
I would I would mention that the fact that when when we talk about uh, uh, people coming here and impacting the city, this proclamation <coughs> is to um, highlight the fact that law enforcement has taken an oath. All city officials have taken an oath to uh, carry out the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Idaho, as well as their uh, their um, oath of office, which states that they will treat everybody fairly and do their job the best of their abilities. So I would just have you take a look at this, read it. If you have any questions, you're welcome to call me and talk to me about it. Uh, I just want to know where the city council stands. Thank you. And as I've shared last week, we'll, I'm we'll, waiting. we're taking that under advisement and we will have some discussion about that. Okay. So. Prob probably not this evening. Okay. I, I appreciate you having the patience to wait a week since you presented it to us. Okay, I'm waiting. And I just gave you the answer, sir. I'm still waiting. I've got 11, 10, 9, 8, All right, 11. wonderful. Okay. Thank you, I'm still waiting. Greg Lansing. Well, I just wanted to comment. The other resolution that's on here has been working through the system for probably at least a month, maybe longer, before it got it came to this point. So. It does take time for it to get vetted and, and come back to possibly, if, if it even is, is allowed to come back to us. It does take time. A week's not enough. Okay. Okay. So, and, and to clarify, we don't have an actual resolution in front of us this evening. We have a presentation. Thank goodness. Is there anyone else wishing to address the council on any items not on the agenda this evening? Seeing no one, we will move on with the uh, regular agenda. The first item is the consent calendar. Council wishes. Suzanne Hawkins. I move approval of the consent calendar. Second. A motion by Suzanne Hawkins, seconded by Ruth Pierce, to approve the consent calendar. Is there any discussion? Sharon, roll call vote, please. Suzanne Hawkins. Yes. Nikki Boyd. Yes. Sean Berger. Yes. Chris Talkington. Yes. Greg Lanting. Yes. Christopher Reed. Yes. Ruth Pierce. Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. So I do see there was one person who had signed up uh, for the church in the park item that was on the consent calendar. So that's been taken care of now. So if you uh, don't want to stick around for the rest of the meeting, you're welcome to sneak out. Uh, so the first item on the agenda under items for consideration uh, this evening is presentation of a welcoming city resolution. We have uh, Dr. Mark Crandall. Dr. Crandall, and I know you have a couple of the scouts you'd like to introduce to join you as well. Thank you for having us here. We're, we're grateful to be here, and as you know, we are here in support of the CSI Refugee Program and the Welcoming City Resolution. We're going to take just a few minutes to explain why we're here and what we're asking the council to do. I'm going to turn the time uh, to our scouts, Ethan Sumption and Caleb Corley. My name is Ethan Sumption. I'm 14. I'm working on my Eagle project. Um, I'm a proud member of the Snake River Council Troop 4. I noticed right away that right away that the refugee center needed a bike shed to like safely store their bikes and provide bikes for people who need it for transportation to like work or school or whatever they need. And so that's what I want. What I would like to do. So, I'm Caleb Gorley. I'm 15, and I'm an Eagle Scout in Troop 4. Um, I had the pleasure of working with the CSI Refugee Center uh, last fall for my Eagle project. Um, when I was looking for something to do for my project, I noticed that they had no way to practice for their Idaho driver's test. Um, so I contacted Goody Motor and um, arranged to have a car <coughs> donated to them, to the center. Um, and then I took some of the scout troop over to Goody Motor and did a few hours of service um, and I just I loved working with the refugee center and I loved the people there as well well thanks Caleb and Ethan we have great scouts I think they're great examples to all of us uh, to the first question of why we are here why does this issue matter so much to us I think you need to know a little bit more about us and who we are uh, as you know Boy Scout troops are sponsored by organizations, so each troop has a sponsoring organization, usually a church congregation. Uh, in this area, almost all the Scout troops are organized and sponsored by LDS wards, just like ours. 
And if you're familiar with church history or the Mormon pioneers, you'll know why that issue really hits home to us. And so in the 1800s, the early church members and Joseph Smith were driven from state to state, New York to Ohio to Missouri to, to Illinois, trying to escape persecution. In Illinois, he was killed by an angry mob, and then Brigham Young took the rest of the church and left the United States trying to escape. They, they went to Utah and settled Salt Lake City, which at the time was northern Mexico. And so today we call them Mormon pioneers, but they were American refugees in every sense of the word. And that is part of why that issue hits home, especially to us. It's why part of why we feel so strongly about helping refugees and preserving uh, religious freedom for all and all religions. Now there's a lot of other reasons to support the Refugee Center and a welcoming resolution. There's a lot of other people involved that would love to see this pass, including, the city count, er, including other cities. For example, the city council in Boise unanimously passed a welcome resolution just a few months ago. The city council in Ketchum did the same. This symbolic gesture is what we're asking the city council to approve. Our refugee center is one of only two centers in Idaho, and their numbers are declining. For example, uh, it, about six months ago, we could expect 110,000 refugees coming into the United States. Now, it's about 50,000. In Twin Falls, that number is also half of what it was. One refugee center in Boise closed their doors in February. Our refugee center is an important part of our community. It has been here for almost 30 years and has provided, the, through the United Nations and official channels, a new start to thousands of families uh, from all over the world. Now, this statement is a symbolic statement. It does not have a financial, fiscal impact. It doesn't have a policy impact. It might not improve, uh, or it might not increase the numbers of refugees coming here. Uh, I don't know if it'll change national policy. I doubt that it will. But I can tell you, it might change the people in this room tonight. It might change some of the people in our city. And I hope that it will send a strong message through the media that we support the center and that we are a welcoming city. I grew up in Twin Falls, and I have always felt safe. I have always felt welcome. We want everyone to feel the same. And I hope that our city council will pass a resolution reaffirming that Twin Falls always has been a welcoming city and will continue to be so, and that we value all of our residents regardless of refugee status, immigration status, or religion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Crandall. Thank you, Dr. Crandall. Thank you, Ethan and Caleb. I appreciate the, the presentation. I know we have a number of folks who would like to provide some input on this issue this evening as well. Um, I grabbed the first sign-up sheet that was back there. If you didn't sign the first one, there is another sign-up sheet. If you're uh, wishing to address the council, you're welcome to <coughs> excuse me to sign up there. So we are going to ask uh, folks to please keep their comments limited to three minutes. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councilman Reed has a screen he'll put up here that'll uh, help you keep an eye on on that time and um, we'll just go through the list as uh, as folks have signed up here so first I have uh, Ron James and again a reminder just to keep your comments to three minutes please state your name and address for the record and whether you are a resident or property owner in the city of Twin Falls my name is Ron begin. James my address is 1155 Plainview Drive I'm a Twin Falls homeowner um, well, please allow me to share with you, for the sake of providing some historical context, a discomforting incident from Twin Falls' early history uh, that I dug up while I was researching, uh, years ago, researching uh, Chinese immigrants who, along with other immigrants such as Herman Stricker, Tom Bell, the Hansons, the Larsons, founded the Magic Valley. Um, this is uh, from the April 14th, 1905 issue of the Twin Falls News, predecessor of the Times News. And during the previous September, 1904, a lone Chinese man um, in search of a new opportunity disembarked from the stagecoach that had brought him to the recently established Twin Falls from the railroad station at Shoshone. Now, the Twin Falls News reported that uh, the fact of his arrival soon became known and there was a hurried conference. And within an hour of his arrival, a group of local citizens approached the Chinese man, took him to a restaurant, bought him, quote, the best meal the town afforded, and then offered the services of the local liveryman who provided a team of horses and carriage complete with driver. Just as the Chinaman, I'm quoting now, and I want to emphasize the term Chinaman is racially derogatory. It's a racist term. I'm quoting from 
the Twin Falls news now when I use that term. As just as the Chinaman was beginning to think he had struck the greatest stamp of his life, the locals informed him that they wanted to take a little ride, wanted him to take a little ride with us. So near sundown, the Twin Falls citizens escorted the Chinese man down to the Blue Lakes Ferry. The Chinese man was then taken as far as the middle of the river where the ferry was then secured for the night. Uh, and the Times, the, the, the Twin Falls uh, News then states, as the weather was warm, the unwelcome visitor did not suffer through having to sleep on the soft side of a plank. In the morning, the Chinese man was allowed to land on the north side, and they're commanded to hit the breeze for Shoshone and tell other Chinese that Twin Falls would not welcome them either. Nine months later, on April 13, 1905, the city of Twin Falls was officially incorporated. I, I gave you all uh, copies. Uh, and, then, um, and then the next day that was reported. And then on page four was this article titled, Why No Chinamen Are Found in Twin Falls? containing the story I just recounted. The article faithfully and unabashedly represents the prevailing sentiments of the Twin Falls community toward non-whites at the time by stating, quote, the idea that Chinamen are a factor in civilization is not entertained here. Twin Falls News, 1905. So now the question before the council, rhetorical question is, which narrative does Twin Falls prefer to choose? We have the narrative of a community that yesterday in the Times News editorial, uh, quote, <coughs> welcome people of all kinds where dreams come true, also illustrated in the recent New York Times article. So, Mr. Or, James, your, your, your time is up, so if you could wrap up your thought, well, I'd appreciate so, it. Or the Thank 1905 you. version in which Twin Falls is a place where the idea that latter-day Chinamen, today's refugees, Mexicans, Muslims, are a factor in civilization is not entertained. These recent attacks, uh, well, let me just, these are skeletons and secrets rattling around in our collective historical cellar that need to be confronted and hopefully overcome. One way would be for the city council to proclaim Twin Falls a welcoming city. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. James. And, and while I certainly appreciate everyone trying to be supportive of those who are speaking, if we could please hold the applause um, to get through the comments, that would be appreciated. Uh, so next, I uh, have Mark Crandall, so you already spoke. Uh, Terry Edwards, did you wish to speak on this issue as well? Oh, can I speak again? I was going to wait until the second public uh, input. Well, if you have input on this item, I might suggest that you present it now. If you don't have item input on this item, then you're welcome to come up later. Terry Edwards, Jerome, Twin Falls. I might mention that it's kind of contradictory. The first gentleman spoke and said how we're always a welcoming city, and it sounds to me like the historian finds out that we weren't. Um, if I had a bowl of M&Ms and offered them to you and your children and then you found out that one of those M&Ms was poisoned and either one of your children or yourself may die, would you grab a handful? I doubt it. Um, also, I might mention that um, what we're thinking about doing with this institution of refugee uh, here is are the refugees here my my parents are second generation I'm third generation refugee and they've contributed to this city or the state this country but these refugees today aren't refugees of today the refugees of today are different and it's not because of their ethnicity it's because of their culture they're they're from another country. They don't assimilate. The problem that we have with that is that they're above the law. As we can see by the cases that have just been litigated, we have three sexual assault refugees that have admitted to it. And you guys kind of ignored it for months on end. The other thing is, is that we have another one that's pending trial. These people come, they're the poison pill. There might be only one of them. 
The problem being is that we don't know who those are, are, those are, and I don't care what it says in the documentation that ZZ puts out, they can't be vetted. So what we've got here is people wandering around, we don't know when they're ex gonna explode, and we know that they're costing the city m much. For every one dollar that they earn, or they pay in taxes, they get four dollars in uh, benefits. So where are you guys gonna come up with that money if we extend this to uh, bigger numbers. And thankfully, there's only 38 have been here since January 1st, been admitted into Twin Falls, which is incorrect on Mr. Crandall's letter. Uh, it's 38. We've got, had 38 since January 1st. In the, in the calendar year, but not in the fiscal year. Thank you. Uh, Rick Narabout. Rick Narabout at 195 River Vista Place. I am a property owner in Twin Falls. So I am an employee of the Idaho Dairymen's Association, and we are proud supporters of immigration reform, and that includes supporting the Refugee Resettlement Center. Uh, that's something that I've uh, spoke to this council about before, and uh, we, we are supportive of this effort and supportive of a resolution that would uh, uh, declare Twin Falls a welcoming city. I wanted to spend the majority of my time today talking about other leadership roles I have in this community and support from those organizations for this effort. Uh, I am also president of the Rapid Soccer Association. We are a uh, athletic club of about 400 athletes, ranging in age from 5 to 19, and we are supportive of this effort. Uh, we have a number of immigrants and refugees that are part of our club. They represent our parents of our athletes, our athletes themselves, our coaches, our referees. Our club would not be the same club without immigrants and refugees. They make up a significant portion of our club, and they are very uh, good members of our club. Uh, we've tried to embrace being a welcoming club in the past. Every year we host a soccer tournament. Uh, if you come uh, to our soccer tournament at Sunway Soccer Complex, you will see as you come into the complex, it's lined with American flags. In between those American flags, you will find flags of other nationalities. And those are representative of our refugees in our community and members of our soccer club. And, and we feel that's very important to show that support uh, for those individuals. Lastly, I, I want to address, uh, address you all on, on a, something that's a little bit closer to home. So I, I'm the father of a biracial family. We've lived in Twin Falls for 15 years. We felt welcome all of those 15 years. No situation is perfect. You do have your awkward moments, but those are far outweighed by the welcoming environment that Twin Falls and the surrounding communities provide. And I think this resolution is important. If I look back and consider, uh, based on the publicity that this community has had the last year, would I make the same decision to move my family here today as I did 15 years ago? and I was an outsider looking in, I'm not sure I have an answer for you. So I think this resolution is important to be able to send that explicit message that we are a welcoming community regardless of race, religion, or nationality. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. So next, uh, so Ethan and Caleb, you already both presented. Uh, Daryl, is it Weber or Weber? Weber. Weber. Daryl Weber. I'm Daryl Weber. I live at 1152 Southview Drive, uh, and I own the property there. Um, I wanted to speak tonight in, in support of the resolution. Um, I want to start by addressing some of the remarks already made, saying that refugees are not M&Ms. They're not pills. They're human beings. Um, and refugees enrich our community. My husband and I moved here to Twin Falls about three years ago, and two of the reasons why we felt that Twin Falls was a place we wanted to make our home was, one, because there was a college here, but two, because of the Refugee Center. Um, and we wanted to move to a community that had that kind of diversity. Um, I'm in English as a second language teacher. I currently teach at the college, um, but previously I did teach some classes at the Refugee Center. Um, and I love my work because I get to work with people, with immigrants, refugees or otherwise, who really understand the opportunity they have. They have experienced extreme hardships in their lives. They've experienced extreme loss. 
and they understand that if they come here, they get a chance, and they work so hard. Um, and, and it's partly that worth, work ethic that I think enriches our community. Um, I th I'm thinking of one student at the Refugee Center um, about a year ago that I was working with who was working um, as a planter. He was planting on farms. I remember at one point they were planting carrots. So he was working all day. They started at dawn, he told me, and he was bending over and planting carrots in the sun in the fields all day. And then he had my English class at night. And he would come after spending the whole day in the fields working and come to English class because he wanted to improve his English, because he wanted to be part of this community, um, and he wanted to contribute to the community. Um, so the refugees are people that want to become a part of our community. They're not people that set themselves apart. Um, they work hard, and they bring wonderful diversity to our community. And so those are some of the reasons why I am in support of this resolution. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, we have uh, Bird Golay. Hi, I'm Bird Golay. I got a piece of commercial property at 2140 Eldridge. I'm kind of a duck out of water tonight, but I thought I should come and talk to you folks about something about this welcoming committee. We've always been a welcoming city. We don't have to have a title. Where are you guys at? Why do you got to have a title? Once you have a title, you always got the title, governor, general, private, sergeant, whatever. And I, I, don't, I don't really think we need a title to have Twin Falls a welcoming center. If you want to go back in our history, we welcomed everybody. Everybody that came here was welcome. We're a different time now in America. It's, things are different in America. So I think we don't need to have a title. We're just a, a lovely city. <laughs> We got a lot of lovely people. We got a lot of neat things, including the College of Southern Idaho and our city. I, I just think this is there is these these Boy Scouts are on a mission. They're doing their job. I don't really think they know what a, what's going on in the world. They can't know. I don't know, and I'm 77 years old. I know a 15 year old kid don't know nothing other than what he's told, and so I I just think. Why are they doing this? Is this for money? Hey, guess what happens? If our government stops the refugees from coming in here, how much money is it going to cost our community? They don't have a job. These people don't have a job. And these people here aren't treated bad that comes as refugees. They got better than people who work here. They make more money than people that work here every day. We're a welcoming community. And I'm just concerned that once you put this title on there, it's for a long time, you guys. So I would really consider not putting this title on our city. It's Twin Falls, Idaho, not Twin Falls, Idaho, welcoming you. You can welcome anybody. And so I'm, I'm just concerned. I realize that these refugees are here. There's all kinds of debate. So be it. I can't, I can't stop it. But just remember, we've been a great city for many, many years with our ups and downs. And uh, I know each and every one of you are wanting to do the right thing. But I, I think that uh, you should probably give this some real consideration and not try to make it up all at once because you got a group of people in here that wants to have a, a title to our city. It's not going to help us a bit. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next we have Tris Woodhead. Um, I'm, can you hear that? Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm Tris Woodhead. I live at 251 Fifth Avenue East, Twin Falls, and we own our house. Um, I've taught school for more than 40 years, and a lot of the children I had from other countries were really wonderful. I had a little Cam Cambodian girl here in Twin. She went to Yale and got straight A's, and she works for the State Department. I had another child visit me, a couple, well, she's not a child anymore. I had her visit a couple of weeks ago, and she works on Wall Street. And when she and her uh, brother and sister came to Twin, none of them could speak English at all. They just spoke Spanish. And now she's working for a bank that makes sure that mortgages are given to people who need mortgages. Um, I think that it's very important for us to set a good example for our children. And we should set that example by 
welcoming people. And if it's got a title, that's great, because I think m most of the teachers in TWIN would be proud to be able to tell their classes that we are officially a welcoming city and that all people are equal. So when I came to TWIN from Southern California, my impression was most of the people in Twin Falls were plump and white. And, um, and now it's, the city has improved a great deal. The more I look around and see different kinds of faces, the happier I am. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Next we have uh, David Woodhead. David Woodhead, uh, 251 Fifth Avenue East, Twin Falls. And I co-own our house. <laughs> she, she's my wife, for those of you who don't know. Tough act to follow. <laughs> I just want to uh, uh, come tonight and uh, give my support to this concept. Thank you, Boy Scouts, for doing this. Um, it's hard to say no to Boy Scouts, so you probably have a good chance here. Um, I've, um, I've been um, very happy to see the transformation that's happened to Twin Falls. Um, I remember one time when Tris was teaching at Bickle, um, I got carted off to these carnivals from time to time. Um, and I happened to notice that all of a sudden it looked like the whole world was in Bickle school because the refugee program had started. And so we started to have people from Cambodia in particular, in fact, that girl, little girl that's no longer a little girl, the one that went to Yale, that whole family became our best friends pretty much and um, we watched them grow and prosper in Twin Falls and that's been the case with pretty much all of the refugees that I've ever had any experience with. I've, I've, I've met several of them and just recently I've rented space in my other property in Old Town to an Iraqi refugee who's going to open a Mideast restaurant and I'm very proud of the fact that that's about to happen because I love that kind of food. <laughs> so look forward to that and please call us a welcoming city. Thank you, David. <laughs> and next I have uh, Julie DeWolf. Twin Falls County, I own several homes and properties in the area. Thank you. Mayor Berger, Vice Mayor Hawkins, Councilman Lanting, Reed, Talkington, Councilwoman Boyden Pierce. Assuming that each of you have both sworn and signed your oath of office, according to the U.S. Code, you are under obligation. According to Idaho State Legislation, Title 74, if you're familiar with that, is about transparent and ethical government. Ethical is relating to moral principles. Moral principles are rules of conduct, right or wrong. The policy and the purpose is hereby declared that the position of the public official at all levels of government is a public trust and the public interest. You are to protect the integrity of the government throughout the state of Idaho assure independence, impartiality, and honesty. You are to inform citizens of the existence of personal interests which may conflict with the interest between the official public trust and private citizen, etc. We go on in chapter four. You are required, a public official, shall not take any official action or make a formal decision or formal recommendation concerning any matter where he has a conflict of interest and has failed to disclose such conflict as provided in this section. If you're uncertain about what those conflicts of interest are, you may want to look up this code before you take a vote. If he is an elected public official of the county or municipality, he shall disclose the nature of the potential conflict of his interest prior to acting on the matter and shall be subject to the rules of the body of which he or she is a member. If he or she is appointed as a public official of the county or municipality, he shall prepare a written statement describing the matter required to be acted upon and the nature of the potential conflict and shall deliver the statement to his appointing authority. 
A conflict of interest means any official or any decision or recommendation by a person acting in a capacity as a public official, the effect of which would be a private pecuniary benefit to that person or a member of that household or a business with which the person or the member or the person's household is associated unless the pecuniary benefit arises out of the following, an interest of the membership, etc., etc. I'm letting you know, I'm aware of that code and I hope you are. I'm going to encourage you to take it very seriously because we are going to hold you accountable. We're going to hold you accountable to the laws of Idaho. So I'm giving you peaceful notification in a public way that we will be investigating your situation specifically as it relates to you and the public interest because your decision about a welcoming city will have an effect on the people who domicile here. It is already affecting so, people. Mr. Wolf, your time is up, so okay. if you could please wrap up finish. to your point, I'd appreciate it. You shall also receive a written letter from me as well, and it will include instructions as well as an overview of what I've just stated. Thank you. Thank you. So that is all of the people who I have who signed up to speak on this item. If there is anyone else wishing to address the council on this item, you can now please come forward. Leah? Again, if you would please state your name and address and whether you are a property owner or resident of the city of Twin Falls, and please limit your comments to three minutes. Good evening. Um, Leah Babayan. I'm a resident, property owner, small business owner, concerned citizen, school board trustee for the best school district in the state of Idaho. I am also a proud m and m and a former a refugee that was resettled here by the CSI Refugee Center. Um, I was very emotional as the line of our Boy Scouts was lined up here, these young uh, 15, 14, 13-year-old young men who don't know better about the world and who might um, just be uh, paid to do this, right, kind of was implied. But I was so proud and overwhelmed with emotion to see um, leadership in our city begin in their generation. I think that gives a lot of hope to all of us living in this country. Um, it also reminds me of a quote that, um, and this I hope the young men take this away with them and, and go further and uh, outside of just this cause, but there is a huge difference between being elected and getting things done. And these young men today demonstrated that they are leading not only our community um, to come out of the closet after 30 years of having a program and people um, adopted into their community to actually be proud of that and to be proud of that in a way that it becomes a staple of this community in a very proud way and not just something tucked away and invisible. But they are also shaping their future, the future they want their community to be by influencing and playing a role in that decision. So. It makes me very proud to hear this conversation take place here tonight. I only wish that my grandparents were alive, um, who also came to this country as refugees here to Twin Falls um, and contributed. I only wish they were alive um, to hear the community that adopted them be proud of it um, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, and that it was not just led by Boy Scouts, but actually led by the many leaders that have decided to, to bring us here. Um, whether it's motivated by earning a, a project badge or whether it's um, motivated by saving an industry that depends on refugees and um, immigrant workers, I think that regardless of what is the motivation, at the end of the day, I think that it, it needs to be highlighted that this city saves lives. And I'm standing before you all today, um, I only speak for myself when I say this, but if it wasn't for the program at CSI, we, I would not be alive, my family would not be alive. Um, I've had that chance, I could become silent about speaking on this subject, but it's important that I speak on behalf of those people that also um, are waiting and surviving and then contributing to the communities they're adopted to. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. <clears throat> So I do, I do have another sign-up sheet here with a few other names. So I have uh, Willie Bachma, 
and then I'll get to the folks who didn't have a chance to sign up to. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Willie Bachman. I'm a dairy farm owner south of Twin Falls. My dairy is at 3374 North 3100 East, the only dairy on Eastland Drive. <laughs> Anyways, my dairy and all the industries that are affected by my dairy's output, which produces enough milk to feed this entire city, every man, woman, and child in this town can have milk products from my dairy every day, and it would fulfill your daily requirements for dairy products. Anyways, my dairy would not function without immigrant labor, for one thing, and with the diversity of people that help this community, the industries that are represented by farming in general would not survive without refugee help and also immigrant help. So I'm in favor of this resolution, and I would ask you to vote in favor of it, too. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Karen McCarthy. Hi. Welcome. I'm a local resident. Uh, the bank and I own my home um, at 189 Buchanan Street. I've been a resident here for 32 years, approximately. The negative side. When I was moving to Twin Falls, Idaho, some people told me, I think, thinking that I was white and plump and would fit in well, <laughs> that um, it was, I would be comfortable. It was mostly white. There weren't many blacks, and the Mexicans knew their place. I got here. My parents came to visit, and being from a town, small town in Crawfordsville that had the Grand Wizard of the KKK residing in it, um, my father read my news, our newspaper, the Times News, and was astounded and said, Karen, I thought journalism like this had gone away in the 50s. I have read nothing like this where every single uh, Hispanic person was defined by where they came from, but not the white people. That's the bad news. The wonderful news was I think the very first house guests we had on arriving here in the summer of 1985 were two Yugoslavian refugees that my husband met at a music store and they all played music together and we could speak very little at all and made symbols to each other like you want to come eat and they played together for hours and it was a friendship that lasted for years. Um, delighted to have my daughters, grow, my children, whoops, sorry son, <laughs> um, my children grow up with refugees who, you know, as the different waves came through, and I would say first it was Eastern Europeans, and my daughter had close, close friends from that community, and as it's progressed, those are the delightful news. I'm a member of the Twin Falls United Methodist Church, and in our basement, the Burundian African Church holds their worship services. We got involved with them. I spent a summer um, helping learn English and the ABCs with a group of them, got to know them. A joyous time is to sneak into our church when they are meeting mm -hmm. and listen to their worship and their music it is a delightful, wonderful experience, and we've gotten to know them by sharing our facility with them through the years. I am a local attorney, and I have had the joy of getting to represent several refugee families with some housing cases, but also with guardianship cases, and that's where you really find their stories, representing children who, um, need guardianships from older relatives because their family is dead or can't be found or are lost. I have read the UN, the UN documents of all the background checks that these children went through to get here and the efforts made to try and find parents and locate them. I have read the documents of their vetting. It's been a privilege to meet them and the families who they have been here with and I'm delighted with this side of Twin Falls, and I urge you to vote that we be a welcoming city. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next, I have uh, Stacy Hallmark. Uh, plus one. Um, my name is Stacy Hallmark, and I live at 2434 Ninth Avenue East. And um, I am here to 
just show my support. Um, I grew up in the Magic Valley, but lived in New York City for 12 years and recently moved back and um, raised three children there. And um, as you can imagine, there's such a diversity of cultures and peoples and religions in New York City. And I really, growing up, I, I didn't have that. And um, I really loved living in, a, in that city and experiencing the richness that can come. And um, I know that I know that there. I understand that people are afraid. It's human nature to be afraid of, of things we don't know or understand or, or things that are different. Um, and so I, I do understand that there, there is a fear among some here. Um, but I truly believe that if people could be exposed and get to know and um, that there would be a greater understanding and um, friendship and bond and love. And um, I, would, I would love for my kids to continue to be raised. Um, in a community that has diversity. And um, I, I know that there are lots of statistics I could share, um, you know, that, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I, I believe that nobody's ever been killed by a terrorist attack by, by a refugee um, in the United States. And I, I know that we hear all this scary news in the world and there's always something happening and something going on. But it happens even, even in these small, I guess it happens everywhere. <laughs> it's, it's, it's universal. Unfortunately, bad things happen sometimes. But I don't think we can live our lives in fear. And um, I believe that Twin Falls would be well served to be a welcoming community to have that title. And I would be proud of that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so again, I have hit the end of those who had signed up. So if there are other folks who would wish to address the council, come on forward. Come on forward, sir. I'm Monty Crandall, 3102 Bomba States in Twin Falls. I own property here. Uh, I'm an obstetrician gynecologist in town. I came here in 1985. Uh, during that time period, I've delivered almost 6,000 babies here. And uh, many of those people have been refugees. I think most of the refugees have come to our office for care, and I've met hundreds of them. And I have not met one of the refugees that I thought was a bad person. They were all good people, every one of them. I didn't feel threatened by any one of them. And now as time has gone on, I've seen their kids grow up, and now they're coming and having babies with our office. And many of them are co-workers in my hospital. They're good, productive citizens of our community. And um, I just hope that we can be supportive of them and show by uh, supporting this resolution that we are good, decent people here in Twin Falls. As these refugees have lived here, they've become a part of us, and I think they are a part of us, and I'm, I'm proud of that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Deborah Silver. Hi, I'm Deborah Silver. I live at 1401 Poplar, and I do own property in this town. A couple years ago, when this issue became came to the front page. I have to tell you that if we had 200 people sign up in support of the Refugee Center within about 36 hours. So I do have a group called Magic Valley Refugee Advocates. Sorry about my voice. Um, but our community supports the Refugee Center. I walked last summer and knocked on over 5,000 registered voters' doors last summer summer and fall and I met so many they're not refugees anymore they're citizens they're, they are voters and they are a big part of this community and it was amazing to me that so many were registered to vote and if they were on my list it means they are voters there are quite a few people in this town who are eligible to vote, but who don't take advantage of that. So we have people who come here, and we offer them hope and help from incredible, incredible this background stories here. This community supports the Refugee Center. Those citizens support this city. And I am proud to be one of the supporters. I must say that it is most of the face, 
faith communities in this community, they are big supporters. And I appreciate so much what this troop is doing, and I encourage you to support their resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. <clears throat> Sorry. Anyone else who wishes to address the council? Yes, in the back. Come on forward. <laughs> My name is Anna Graff, and I'm a resident of Twin Falls at 232 Locust Street North, Twin Falls, Idaho. I don't have much to say, but I do want to come up and lend my voice to this in support. I have a son, I'm a single mom, and I look forward to raising him in a community that is open and welcoming to other cultures, to other people. He's going to get to grow up <laughs> with access to a much richer culture than what I grew up in in the same area. And one of the ways that that happens is through this program and this opening. This Let him speak. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not sure what's going to come out. You might get Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. <laughs> all that to say, I wanted to lend my voice and support. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was cute. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the council on this issue? Yes. Heather. Jesse. Jesse, sorry. My name is Jesse Stroop. I live at 3161 East, 3200 North. I'm a little young to, young to own property in Twin Falls. Um, I'm not going to say yay or nay on anything you guys are going to do, but I am going to ask you, what are you welcoming these people to? I know I've brought up this issue a couple times before, but the housing that they're living in is pretty terrible, and nothing's really changing. So I just encourage you, before you say anything about being a welcoming city, you check what you're welcoming people to. Are you welcoming them to a better life? Or are you welcoming them to crummy apartments, rusting water pipes, um, exposed electrical outlets that can harm people, cramming them into these apartments down here? Like they're sardines, really. And that's a big deal. So that's all. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Reagan Larson. I am a resident of Twin Falls, and I'm with that scouting troop over there. Um, now, I am proud that I live in this uh, city, Twin Falls, and I do believe that these refugees are looking for a better place. Yes, there may be that one M&M that is poison and does do all these bad different things, but that's what you're going to get anywhere, and we, unfortunately, have some of those people here in Twin Falls. Now those people, the when they're living in other countries and uh, other places, when your alarm clock is a bomb blowing up the house next to you, you know you want to go to a better place. They're looking for a place to come and some of them do end up here in Twin Falls. Now what these people are wanting to do is they want a better place where they know that they will be safe from the terrors that they have back there. Yes, we will always have those people who do have all these offenses, but they will be the ones that do have to live with that, and most oftentimes they will end up going to jail and punishing and get punished for their crimes. Now, I, like I said, am a Boy Scout, and us Boy Scouts live by a certain law. A scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Now all of those things, they add up, and what we feel about this, I'm here supporting my uh, fellow scouts, one, uh, which both have Eagle Projects associated with the Refugee Center. What they are doing is they're trying to make Twin Falls a better place. And if we are a place that does allow these refugees to come, and come to a better place seeking freedom, I would be very proud to tell everybody if I do ever leave here saying that I came from a place that welcomed refugees and people who came here. Now these people uh, do have, they have bad pasts with uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS and 
all these different terrorists in their countries, coming here, these people, if we were to kick them out and not allow them, those nine out of ten people who are good, they came here seeking a better place to live, and if they can't find anywhere, then we might as well just be as those other countries, not letting them live there, and because if they can't live here, then how will they know what good of a uh, city and town we are? <coughs> now, this uh, city's uh, big brother, Boise, has unanimous, uh, unanimously passed this, and so obviously they believe that there is going to be good coming from this. Now, I may be just a 15-year-old kid who doesn't know anything, but of the few things that I do know, I know that sometimes in class if one kid does something bad and we all get punished for it, no one likes that, and that's just how these refugees are feeling. And so I am in support of allowing these people to have a better place than where they were. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was another, yes. My name is Tanner Beamer, and I'm a resident. I live at 1085 White Birch. Uh, and uh, I really, I've been involved in this issue in a number of different ways. Uh, I'm a former student at the University of Idaho, and I worked on this issue a little bit uh, what, during my time there. And I wasn't entirely sure uh, if I was uh, going to speak tonight or not, uh, but then it became clear from some of the previous speakers that uh, I'm not much older than these gentlemen in the scarves behind you. Uh, I'm 23 years old. It became very clear that uh, we can't formulate uh, good opinions because we haven't experienced much and uh, call it good old-fashioned millennial rebellion. And I decided that I'd come and share a few thoughts with you in response to that. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is something that the good doctor said in his opening, and that's something he said, you know, maybe this won't influence national policy. And I really want to stress something to this body and those that are listening in the audience today. This town is doing something right. Rural communities across this country are disappearing, and in mass droves, young people my age are moving inward to the city. And that's something that is a national trend. But Twin Falls isn't doing that. Twin Falls is doing something right. And if you don't believe me, there's a tiny newspaper back east that decided to do a little story on us a couple of days ago. Actually, they're not that small. They have a daily readership of somewhere in the tens of millions. Uh, and they decided to come and talk about what we're doing right. And so don't, don't think that this, this small gesture uh, doesn't have impact beyond just the city limits of the city of Twin Falls. And then kind of along that, we talked about the fact that, oh, it's just a title. What does title mean? Title doesn't mean anything. Well, that's, that's also not entirely true. You know, I work a lot with uh, uh, the FFA organization. Uh, you, they were just in Twin Falls. They left last week. Their state convention was here on the CSI campus. And I meet with a lot of Hispanic students, and in one of my interactions, uh, they, they told me, you know, they're scared. They're, they're, they're here on legal terms and legal status, but they're scared because of the way that the national media is portraying uh, minorities in this country. And they, 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 they say that, you know, it's, it's, not that, it's not that I'm scared because of my status. I'm just scared about what other people think. And so I guess all that just to reiterate, yes, it can have an, an influence well beyond the borders of this city. And then on top of that, yeah, it might just be a title. And to most of us, title doesn't mean anything. But to some of us, that title can mean everything. Thank you. Yes. Lanny Whitney, I'm a resident of Kimberly. Uh, one of my dearest friends moved here four years ago, actually a little over four years ago, um, a refugee that came from uh, Baghdad, Iraq, Iraq, she always corrects me. And, um, and just commenting about the conditions that the refugees might come to here in Twin Falls, um, this mother of four young, very young children and father came to Twin Falls, and one of the comments that she made was that um, they came from a city where bombings and sh shootings occurred daily, and they would hear them throughout the day, and her experience was one of sending her children out the door in the morning or her husband and really um, truthfully praying and hoping that she would see them at the end of the day. And so to, um, 
to share what she expressed coming to Twin Falls of the safety that they felt of not hearing shootings and bombings throughout the day is um, they felt a lot of gratitude for that and um, they didn't feel um, hard done by or upset about their conditions. They were just grateful for the couple of plastic chairs that were in the kitchen, for a roof over their heads, and for silence of not being in the midst of a bombing city and chaos and shambles of a city that is in constant um, warfare. And so I think that that helps us with all the um, the things that we have around us that we take for granted. Um, we might get a little confused as to thinking what are they coming to. Not to say that I don't want to improve that because I, I work towards that with each of you trying to improve what they come to. But um, but I know that those efforts are being made on all fronts. So um, I know that they're grateful to be here and I'm, I'm so glad that they're here too. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Yes, down here in the front. Uh, my name is Drew Parker. I live at 838 Green Tree Way uh, here in Twin Falls. Um, I similarly wasn't going to get up here and say anything, um, but then I, I thought of some people that I've met and, and I had to. I had the privilege of living in Central Africa for a few years, and while I was over there, if I could express to you how welcome and how um, I was received with open arms over there, regardless of my, my race or my nationality, um, I, I felt that I would be condemned if I didn't get up here and speak for those people that I've met and speak for their generosity. And I think us as twin, as, as members of the Twin Falls community should likewise take a look at ourselves and think um, if roles were changed, would we not want someone or somewhere to feel welcome? Um, I, I know that... There are much more yays than nays, and I just wanted to add my voice to that and to let you know that I love these people and I'm willing to welcome them as best as I can here in Twin Falls. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, in the back. My name is Linda Gooden. I live here in Twin Falls at 429 Buchanan Street. And I, I um, while no one here can not have sympathy for the refugee people, especially since we've seen the things that have happened with the gassing and everything in Syria in the last week, your heart goes out to those people. But I don't want Twin Falls to forget about the little five-year-old girl that was sexually molested by three refugee boys. Um, she was innocent. She didn't do anything wrong. And yet she was assaulted by those boys. And this community did not reach out to her. Um, she should have gotten federal and state funds. She never did. She never got counseling. CARES, I was here last week and heard CARES talk about cancel, ca how important it was to counsel young children shortly after they were sexually abused. She's never had counseling. Um, several people came and asked the council to help them find a home for this family. They still had to live next door to the boy, one of the boys who molested her, for months. And finally, some citizens in the community reached out, got her home, um, got them a car, helped them get established in the community. And so while my heart goes out to those people too, my heart goes out to Jayla. She's had no counseling. She's had no support from the community at all. And um, when the council was asked to help find them a place to live, never got a response from anybody. So my concern <clears throat> is the fairness. You know, everybody reaches out to the refugee community, and, and I'm not opposed to them. But the treatment should be fair to the American citizens, too, and I want everybody to remember what happened to that little girl. Thank you. May I? Yes, Suzanne Hawkins. I, I just want to go on the record with that. I do want you to know that I did reach out to the family. So to say that nobody on the council tried to help when they were looking for housing or help is an unfair statement. I know, I know that Greg Lantine 
took money out of his pocket to help that family. And this community stepped up with that GoFundMe page and did help. And I understand there's a lot of legal what's and things that we don't understand as council members, and it's out of our jurisdiction. But for you to say that none of us tried to help is an unfair statement, and I just want to go on the record with that. Thank you. So, it, so I, just ma to clarify the I, I appreciate your comments. We can't have a debate back and forth across the across the room. Okay, it, these these issues have been shared clearly. It's been communicated with the family. Again, I I appreciate your frustration and concern, and I thank you for sharing it with us. Is there anyone else here wishing to speak on the uh, welcoming resolution? Yes. I am Cindy Yarger. I live at 357 Blue Lakes Boulevard North. I'm not an owner, but I'm a renter. So. Anyway, a resident, though. I want to speak from a, just a little bit different angle. I'm an, I'm an American. My parents immigrated from the Netherlands. I'm the first generation born in, in the U.S. But a minute, oh gosh, forgive me. <laughs> um, I have spent time overseas, and I have been welcomed in every country that I've lived in, except for Honduras. And there, they don't like, or at that time, they did not like me because I was an American, an American. We tend to think that Americans are loved and welcomed everywhere in the world. They're not. They are not. But I tell you, it was really strange to go there and not be loved, not be welcomed, simply for that reason. I was an American. They were burning an American flag in the park. Children threw rocks at me and then ran. Now, I don't want anybody to come into Twin Falls and feel that they're not welcome or that we don't like them because of where they came from. We are humans. We're people. So I would say it doesn't even matter if they're refugees, whatever they are. Come to common ground. We are people. We are one. So I would vote that we welcome people and that we proudly wear a title that says we are welcoming. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience wishing to address the council on this issue? Yes. Once again, like so many people here, I wasn't planning on speaking, but I'm Bethany Rasmussen, and I'm a resident of Twin Falls. Um, so I was reading over your proclamation here, Mr. Mayor, and I couldn't help but notice that there wasn't a lot of information about So which this. resolution are you reading? This one, for so, the safe city. So that actually That's is one that was drafted one? by Mr. Edwards, not oh. by the council. Oh, Okay. There was a spot here for you to sign in, so I'm sorry. Yeah, that so that's just a draft statement. that was presented to us as a, another option that we might consider. Oh, okay. Okay, there just wasn't a lot of information on it, and so I was slightly confused how this was going to affect. I know that um, the troop leader mentioned that it probably would not affect a lot of things, but as we know, all of us, that whenever someone moves here, there is a lot of effect. Um, my mom moved here back about 30 years ago, and since she has moved here, I was born in Twin Falls, but since she has moved here, our population has moved from about 25,000 to now pushing 55,000. Um, so for me, I also have family members who look different than I do. I won't call them a different race, but they, we all share different characteristics. And we have experienced the love of our community as well as um, the man who spoke earlier that he has a biracial family. And I don't quite understand. I love being a welcoming city. We need to love people. They are most important. When everything else burns, people are going to last. They're the ones that are going to last and be here permanently and what we need to fight for. But I'm curious how stamping this on our city is really going to change people's minds. We've heard people on both sides of the issue. Um, so to me, I don't really understand what this is going to change. Um, I think 
it's a good idea to strive for, to be a welcoming city, to love people and to understand that they, that they do, they matter. But I also have a hard time looking at what's happened to, like, Jayla, and looking at that issue and saying, okay, is every need being met? The larger our city becomes, the harder it is for us to take care of those individual cases. And I want that. I want that for everybody. So when they come here, they are now someone that me as a citizen, I take responsibility for their safety, their, their well-being. As a taxpayer, that's what that goes toward. And I want them to be taken care of and loved and appreciated. I don't believe that we're not a welcoming city already. I, and maybe I'm just kind of reiterating a lot of different ideas that people have already said. But to me, I, I want to be known as welcoming. But my question is as well, if this goes a step further and we become more of like a sanctuary city, what will we attract? That was my immediate thought. I had no thought of refugees. I had no thought of immigrants. I had a thought of people coming here who have done crimes in other states and decide, oh, hey, we're going to go over here no matter if they look like me or not. So anyway, those were just kind of my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. All right, last call for anyone else who wishes to address the council. Otherwise, we'll turn it over to the council for discussion. All right, I don't see anyone else, so council. Chris Talkington. <clears throat> Been a good meeting tonight. It shows the DNA at Twin Falls. 80% of you are on what I consider the right side, the light side. We always give room and time for people to speak their opinion, no matter whether we agree or disagree. And that's part of the strength of local government and our democracy. I keep hearing references to the Idaho Constitution. I have to tell you, I'm guided by the U.S. Constitution. All men are created equal. That's my guiding dogma. I've lived in a foreign country. I have been welcomed when I didn't speak the language, didn't look at them, look at like them the same way. I bring that value back to Twin Falls, but I'd like to also mention that we have a bit of history in Twin Falls that is a stigma, a, a dark point of our history. At the beginning of World War II, we had a Japanese concentration camp. There is a very polite language for it, but I had a secretary that as a child was incarcerated there. That is a blemish that Twin Falls will never be able to erase, but for God's sakes, we can at least learn a lesson not to judge people by how they speak, how they look, but how they act and treat others. You know, this town is 113 years old. Twin Falls was formed on the basis of opportunity, open doors, hard work, looking each other in the eye and speaking clearly and telling people what you thought and admitting mistakes. The uh, history of Twin Falls is based on these positive American values, and I don't want to re recede back into the darkness of suspicion and paranoia. The only time I've been paranoid is when I lived in that foreign country and during the Cold War, and I had the Cuban government trying to kill me. But we still spoke the same language, and I met Cubans afterwards, and uh, with, uh, some of them are almost friends now. Even the people in this audience that are speaking against a welcoming community, I try to have dialogue with, usually not successfully, but that's because I'm a left-handed Irish and that's my fault. I want you to know that Twin Falls wants to be a welcoming community, but we have to prove it. And a resolution similar to the one that Boise passed, I think is the first stop, a first step. One other little addendum, I keep hearing the people who don't want Twin Falls to be a welcoming community complain about those people stealing jobs. Twin Falls is above full employment. Anybody that wants to have a job in Twin Falls can get a job. Don't ride that dog. It don't, it don't hunt, okay? I'm in favor of a welcoming community, but I see other council wanting to speak, and uh, let's just remember Four out of five people, more than 80% of the people representing Twin Falls DNA, support a welcoming community. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Greg Lanting. I'd like I'd like to thank Dr. Crandall not only for his uh, 
work with the scouts. I'm also an Eagle Scout, so all of those who are there, uh, I'm, I'm proud of that fact. And uh, and some of your uh, Eagle Scout projects are seem to be uh, well recognized for this for the city as, as a whole. I tended to do those for my 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 sponsoring group was the Hollister Presbyterian Church, and uh, I did my projects for the church. So I, I wished I had expanded to the community as a whole. Uh, I also like to thank Dr. Crandall for being a leader of uh, in uh, health care for this this city. Uh, he helped my he was my mother's uh, heart doctor, and I certainly appreciate his uh, uh, his help in, along uh, that way. I to him in favor of this resolution. Uh, I believe that it will, as the one gentleman said, who needs to get a job at broadcasting. His voice was unbelievable. Yes. Uh, I can't remember his name right now, but he has an excellent voice. Uh, talk about that it does mean things to certain people. And if they, if they feel welcome, then, uh, then that's, that's, that's enough for me right now. Uh, and I'm going to say this very clearly this time because I said it one time before and the Times News quoted me rather poorly. Uh, we are all children of immigrants. Last time they got it really messed up. I'm not sure how. Uh, I was like to, proud to see a few Dutch people show up because that's my my background. My grandparents came from the Netherlands to uh, to the United States and uh, and actually settled in Amsterdam, Idaho, which most of you don't know where it's at. It's between Hollister and uh, Rogerson out there, and they they settled there because that way they could speak. Dutch and not have to for most of the time. My my oldest my oldest uncle actually went to school speaking no English, and was learned how to speak English at school. By the time my dad got there, who was the youngest child, he already knew because his brothers and sisters all spoke English to him because they'd learned in school. Um, I think it's an important for the city of Twin Falls to support. Uh, being a welcoming city, and I will gladly vote yay when that is presented to us. Thank you, Greg. Nikki Boyd. Diversity is really important, and diversity comes in many forms. And one of the things is when it comes to diversity, we are each responsible for educating ourselves. We are responsible for perhaps traveling, perhaps visiting. I think somebody served a mission and went to another country. It's very important for us to understand that we are very proud of America, and, and it is a land of opportunity. It's not a guaranteed anything. People that come here come here for a better chance at things. There's no guaranteed outcome. And there's risk in life, and sometimes when you go places, it doesn't work out. Like in Honduras, that just didn't work out, but that didn't stop her from living a good, productive life. I came from a big city, and I, I love big cities. I, I still do, but I chose Twin Falls. I chose Twin Falls, and this is where I've raised my children. And I believe that tonight, you guys have demonstrated what a welcoming city this is. Everything from scouts to, to dairy farmers to people who serve at their church. I've been a, a, a real estate agent for a long time, and I was blown away years ago by how many people drove through Twin Falls on the way to somewhere else and stayed and thought, when I you know, retire, I'm coming here, or we're thinking about changing jobs, we want to look here. I hear all the time, all the time, and it, it amazes me how friendly everybody is to strangers here. When I first came here, I, I found it very friendly, but I didn't find it as welcoming because I had different kind of license plates. <laughs> and, and my neighbor simply said, Change them over, you know, get rid of those plates. And, and, but we all have experiences, but I believe that Twin Falls is a welcoming city. It has always been a welcoming city, and we have always been for all the citizens. Any oath anybody has ever taken 
It's for the Constitution, it's for the state of Idaho, and it's for all citizens. Our police pledge to serve all the citizens. We are all created equal under God. And when I read on here that, um, you know, we were referring to Boise, how they did this. And it, it, when it says, you know, the symbolic thing, it says that they want to be a, a welcoming city, but it's right here. It is non-binding with no financial impact, but it's a powerful statement of support. And I don't think I need a welcoming city put in writing I think we need citizens who all of us pony up, and we are welcoming citizens. And we do the acts. We don't have something on a piece of paper because everything that these say, the safe city, uh, the welcoming city, all of this stuff, that's how we live. That's how we do it here already, and I'm very proud of that. And I thank you all for demonstrating that to me tonight. Thank you, Nikki. Suzanne Hawkins. Thank you. I came tonight with a prepared speech. I had um, worked through a number of issues because I feel that Twin Falls is a very welcoming community. And I'm, I'm going off script now. You know, I thought um, this last Saturday I had the opportunity to give out awards to all the volunteers at the Senior, Cita at the senior Center for the last year. Last year when um, Special Olympics decided they were going to host their state games in Twin Falls, we had a volunteer for every athlete that showed up for those games. They were blown away. They have never seen anything like that in our state before. If you look at our service clubs, if you look at our churches, you look at what Salvation Army does, if you look at the Boy Scouts, if you look at all the committees and commissions that help the city of Twin Falls achieve its goals, this community is a community that helps their neighbors like no other community in the world. I've heard Red Cross say when there's a disaster in Twin Falls, they don't have to come because the neighbors take care of it before they get here. And they don't find that anywhere else. We're a unique blend of different personalities and people who come together. We find solutions for our problems. We welcome anyone into our community who wants to be a part of our community. We help our neighbors, and that has been de demonstrated tonight over and over and over and over. When I came in tonight, I didn't feel like I wanted to support this resolution. I'll be honest, because I felt like it was written to be a bigger, divisive tool in our community. We have two very strong personalities, and both sides of this issue have real, real concerns, and they have real positive points. I would like to see us as a community, as a welcoming community who includes everyone, come to the table together and maybe take this resolution and the safety resolution and find common ground and come up with a resolution that is Twin Falls. It is not Boise. It is not Ketchum. But it represents Twin Falls at its core. That it includes those who want to see the vetting increased for refugees to help their security so they feel safe. They have a right to feel safe. They live here too. But at the same time that when we have refugees that we can truly help, that we reach out that hand as neighbors, as humans, and help each other. And so when I vote on this resolution tonight, it is not what you're reading in front of you, but I would like to encourage us as a council to create our own resolution that represents Twin Falls for what we are and who we are and not copy what our neighbors have done and find a common ground that welcomes our refugees and welcomes our legal immigrants and at the same time welcomes those that were born here and are at the heart of this community that keep it going. And I, I, I don't want to, I guess I want to get off my soapbox, but I want to say thank you to everyone, everyone who spoke on both sides of this issue tonight. You really made me look inside and do some soul searching on how I feel and what I can and want to support in this community. And it's because of every one of you that Twin Falls is what Twin Falls is, a very welcoming place to all. Thank you, Suzanne. So I would echo just a couple of comments that I've heard from a, a few of the council members here. So in all of my experiences dealing with folks who were here visiting, perhaps it was a company looking to possibly locate here, 
Um, you know, I work at the Chamber of Commerce office. We see hundreds of visitors every day. Um, without exception, the first thing I hear from them when I'm talking about their, their interaction in the community is how friendly and how kind and how welcoming our community is. And that's not just Twin Falls. That's the entirety of the Magic Valley. I, I do believe it is what makes us unique and special. Um, I think it is uh, more important than our natural setting. It's more important than the miracle of agriculture here. It's more important than all, all those things. It's the people who live here. And even in this room, I know we all have differences. Uh, we have concerns about uh, politics. We have concerns about how money gets spent or doesn't get spent. Um, but I don't think there is a one of us in this room that can't say we want to be kind and welcoming people. And um, we've had our blemishes in history. And to Councilman Talkington's point, I think we, as leaders in this community, and you as citizens in this community, have an obligation to learn from history and to try to correct uh, those things that have not gone quite the way they should have in the past. Um, but this needs to be more than just words on paper. I am so immensely proud of these Boy Scouts who have come here this evening. Um, and some of the other speakers referred to them, uh, Leah in particular, talking about it, they're the leaders of this issue. It's not the seven of us. Uh, this is coming from our community. This wasn't the seven of us, or two of us, or one of us saying, here's my agenda. I'm going to ramrod down this community's throat, which I have heard from many in this community over the last week. This is about um, young individuals in our community taking their responsibility to embrace Twin Falls, to celebrate uh, what it's about, to make sure it's a better place for them in the future and those others who live here. And so I am uh, in full support of taking the request, which is that Twin Falls should have some sort of welcoming resolution, because you didn't bring a draft of one, per se. You brought some examples. Um, and, and I do think that we collectively um, should take some time to make sure that it is reflective of what we are now and also looking toward the future. So I pulled up our strategic plan uh, here while others were speaking. And we have a focus area in our current city strategic plan. Again, not written by the seven of us or the city staff. This was written by the community with input from the community. And our focus area seven is about a responsible community. And our vision is that the Twin Falls community has retained its human face as it has grown over time. New residents are welcomed and made to feel part of the tightly knit community. You know, this was written three years ago. This was well before the most recent controversial conversation going on in our community. Um, to me, this references a 30-plus year old refugee resettlement program. It represents a history of immigration in our community to take care of the needs of the land. It celebrates the western migration of of after we were a state and well before we were a state with, with the Mormon pioneers who came through. It's just who we are. And I made similar comments many, many months ago at the peak of this initial conversation in our community. And I'm, I'm thankful that we have uh, been through a very difficult time as a community, but that we can have a civil conversation to talk about putting on paper what it is we are and what we want to be. Um, so again, I thank everyone for, for being here this evening and being a part of this conversation. And um, I would certainly entertain some direction from the council. Chris Talkington. I would uh, request that the council uh, direct the city manager, city staff rather, to uh, provide a first draft of a Twin Falls as a welcoming community with uh, language that may be modified as we jointly discuss it. Second. So a motion by Chris Toggin and seconded by Greg Lanting to uh, direct city staff to give a first blush at this and uh, to have some further discussion as a council. Suzanne Hawkins. I would like to amend that motion to include um, 
that city staff reach out to some of the public who spoke maybe tonight and if offer them a chance to by email or however submit ideas of things that they should think should be included or should not be included in this and just kind of get a little more pulse from the community and make sure it's truly a community document and not a city staff document. Is there a second to that motion? Second. So a motion by Suzanne Hawkins, seconded by Chris Reed to encourage staff to reach out to the community and some who spoke this evening to uh, do our best to gather community sentiment here. Chris Talkington. Well, I just wonder, Suzanne, we've had 24 speak, uh, speakers here tonight, pro and con. Don't you think this is uh, hearing the community? I do think it's of the community, but I think before we put pen to paper, it's a good idea to maybe give them a chance to submit ex what they presented tonight so that staff doesn't have to go back and listen to the recordings. Any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. This is on the amendment? On the amendment, yes. Sean Berger? Yes. Chris Talkington? No. Greg Lanting? Yes. Christopher Reed? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Uh, motion passes six to one. So is there any discussion on the uh, main motion as amended? Chair and roll call vote, please. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berger? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Christopher Reed? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Uh, once again, thanks to everyone for your input this evening. So. Uh, staff will begin working on a draft, and this will certainly be noticed up on a future agenda before the council takes any action. We'll have some opportunity for conversation. So with that, I'm going to ask that we take a uh, six-minute uh, recess, and we will reconvene at 20. Thank you. So I'll uh, reconvene the council meeting for Monday, April 10th, after our short break. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is a request to reappoint uh, Susan Petrozelli, Chad Debbie, and Gerald Martins, as well as appoint Ross Conlon to the Development Impact Fee Advisory Committee. So uh, Susan, Gerald, and Chad, or Susan and Gerald, uh, recently completed their first uh, term, a full term of three years, and Chad completed a first partial term of one year on the Development Impact Fee Advisory Committee. All three of these members have had uh, great attendance and participate on the committee. Recently, city staff published a vacancy for the committee, but uh, did not receive any applications. Uh, the council recently confirmed appointments to the Planning and Zoning Commission, and there were some well-qualified candidates for the Planning and Zoning that were not able to be appointed because we just had more applicants than positions. And so staff reached out to those applicants uh, who were not appointed to Planning and Zoning, and one of them, Ross Conlon, uh, has expressed interest in this opportunity. Councilman Talkington, uh, Chairman Brad Wills, uh, city staff and myself recently interviewed uh, Ross. Uh, he spent 30 years previously with the Pocatello and American Falls Police Departments, uh, has a great desire to serve the community, and uh, we felt he would be a great addition to this committee, offering a different point of view on growth and development. So it's important to point out that this uh, particular commission or committee um, has some specific seats that must be filled by uh, various sectors, engineering, developers, so forth. Uh, but it also includes at-large uh, members, and that's a position that Ross would fill. So he comes with no, no engineering or development uh, background per se, uh, but could really be kind of a voice of the, of the at-large community. So uh, I would uh, request that we uh, appoint him to uh, appoint all of these folks, uh, the reappointments as well as Ross, to the impact development impact fee advisory committee. Chris Talking. Well, I'd just like to make one additional comment to your. Uh relation of what went on, uh, even as uh, Mr. Uh, Ross Conlon uh, has not been involved in development, been in public service through the police department, he does understand that the impact fee uh, advisory committee uh, is a function of a policy that has been approved by courts throughout the state where the cost of growth can be assessed to future development and those funds be applied toward four categories of police, fire, 
streets and park improvements. So there is no question as to whether this is, uh, I guess the term is constitutionally upheld in the state of Idaho. And I would certainly uh, I think he'd be a good um, additional candidate for our group. Ruth Pierce. I'd like to make a motion if you're ready for that. You bet. I would move that we reappoint Susan Petrozelli, Chad Debbie, and Gerald Martins, as well as appoint Ross Conlon to the Development Impact Fee Advisory Committee. Second. Motion by Ruth Pierce, uh, seconded by Chris Reed to uh, approve the appointment that was <coughs> requested. Is there any discussion? Mitch Humble. Just one little point of clarification. The, the vacant position, and we forgot to to help you out with this on your report, Mayor, but the vacant position that's going to be uh, filled by Ross is a partial term. Okay. The other three are full terms, three years, and, and I think Ross is a, is a two-year term, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. It might be one, but it's a partial term. Okay. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, Chair, and roll call vote, please. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Christopher Reed? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Barriker? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. And next is a request to adopt an ordinance for a zoning district change and zoning map amendment for approximately 2.14 plus or minus acres from C1 PUD to C1 ZDA to develop a hotel and accessory uses the maximum building height of 55 feet on property located east of 1788 Washington Street North. And we have Mitch Humble. Um, I had pity on Renee and I let her go home <laughs> a little early tonight and told her I would go ahead and take this for her. Um, if you'll recall, back on January 9th, the city council had a public hearing on this request. Um, at the end of that public hearing, approved the request and directed staff to prepare an ordinance. There's been some time to get all those details straightened out because there's a few conditions on that. Uh, but in the end, we have the ordinance ready for your adoption tonight. Um, it is an ordinance, and so adoption of this ordinance will require the, if you want to do it tonight, will require the suspension of the rules and, and all that jazz. So if you have any questions, we can try to answer them for you, but otherwise it's pretty straightforward, adoption of the ordinance. Thank you, Mitch. Any questions for Mitch? Council wishes? Do we have an ordinance number? It's ordinance number 2017-10. Chris Talkington. I would move to place uh, ordinance 2017-10 on third and final by title only under suspension of the rules. Second. Motion by Chris Talkington, mm -hmm. seconded by Ruth Pierce to suspend the rules and place ordinance 2017-10 on third and final reading by title only. Is there any discussion? Chair and roll call vote, please. <clears throat> Greg Lanting? Yes. Christopher Reed? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Chris Talking? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Sharon, would you read the title, please? Ordinance number 2017 10. An ordinance <laughs> of the City Council of the City of Twin Falls, Idaho rezoning real property below described, providing the zoning classification therefore, and ordering the necessary amendments to the area of impact and zoning districts map. Suzanne Hawkins. I move approval of ordinance 2017-10. Second. Motion by Suzanne Hawkins, seconded by Nikki Boyd to approve ordinance 2017-10. Is there any discussion? Roll call vote, please, Sharon. Christopher Reed? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. <clears throat> uh, next, we have a presentation on the Twin Falls Urban Renewal Agency Main Avenue Redevelopment Project. We have uh, Paul Johnson with CH2M. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. I was at, again, my name is Paul Johnson and I'm the owner's representative for the Urban Renewal Agency on the Main Avenue project. We have, I think, an exciting update for you tonight. I was asked to give a, the same update that we presented to the Urban Renewal Agency. Um, the bottom line is the project is um, just under budget 
and on schedule so far. That's exciting. <laughs> Do I have three Presentation minutes? Presentation complete. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep it very brief. Um, this picture on the, uh, the cover of the monthly report is from the March 24th pre-bid conference. Uh, there were one of three walkthroughs with uh, large groups of contractors interested in bidding the project. Guho Construction had arranged that. Again, they are our construction manager, general contractor, managing the project. This is a summary. Uh, as we talked the last time, there was the landscape removal contract of $56,538. About $9,500 of that is being turned back into the URA from savings on that landscape removal that took place That's in great. February. Item two, uh, we went to the URA board last week with a request for the overall amendment for the guaranteed maximum price on the project. After assembling all the bids uh, from the various subcontractors, most of them from Twin Falls. Most of the awards are going to Twin Falls subcontractors. I think there's just one from away from the area. All the rest are from Twin Falls. Um, that totaled um, $6,389,570. So when we add the two together, the total GMP shown in item three is $6,446,115. And that is about $54,000 under our budget. Tomorrow at the groundbreaking at 12.30 p.m. at Columbia Bank, no doubt there will be representatives from the URA and the city talking about the value of the project. We like to talk in engineering terms about cost to worth ratios or cost <coughs> to value. The value will be tremendous, obviously. I don't want to steal anyone's thunder. Much greater than the $6.5 million price tag for the project. My part, our, our part as a team, was to bring the project in within the $6.5 million budget, and we believe that we've done that. Um, the earlier estimates by Guho were $6,446,000, and by OTAC, the design firm, $6,493,000. So we were within four one thousandths of a percent of Guho's prediction and within uh, three quarters of one percent of OTAC's prediction. So those are really good numbers. In addition to that, we've afforded some additional scope within the $6.5 million budget. We have uh, several fire hydrants that will be included on Main Avenue. The others are on the seconds, but it will it'll be a safer street in the future with uh, new fire hydrants on Main Avenue in addition to everything else with the streetscapes and the brick sidewalks. We'll have cast aluminum light poles instead of the cheaper fiberglass light poles. So we were able to afford that within the budget. And the storm drain system is upgraded, so it will handle more uh, storm flows. There are other projects downstream outside of the project area that will need to be improved in the future, but Main Avenue will have a more comprehensive storm drain system to handle storm events. So that's some additional good news afforded within the budget. Uh, the rest of this is just how the GMP was assembled by by Guho, and um, it all came in within the budget. They have every intention of returning any savings back to the owner um, at the end of the project. There's a 5% contingency held within that $6.5 million. If it's not tapped into or if we take only a little bit, the rest of it will be made available for other URA projects. Right. Just a quick note on schedule. We, I'm sorry, uh, Suzanne Hawkins had a question. Sorry. Um, do you know how, if you were able to find a way to incorporate um, flagpole holders in all of that as well? We talked about that last time, but yes, you weren't sure. Yes, I have sure. an update on that just oh, right, sorry. After, just right okay. after this, this point. I won't get ahead of you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're right on schedule. Again, groundbreaking tomorrow at 1230 p.m. at Columbia Bank, and that will be right after the State of the City presentation that I understand is at 1130 a.m. at the Orpheum Theater. Okay. Um, construction will begin, or actually demolition will begin in area one, as you see from, uh, from Gooding to Shoshone, and that will take place beginning April 17th. So each block will take about two months to rebuild, and there will be an overlap of about one month per block. So we anticipate substantial completion of the project on October 31st, 2017. Right on schedule.
Now, now to the point about the uh, the flags. Excuse me, Paul. Uh, in all businesses and the respective blocks, know when their time of maximum discomfort is going to be. They they've been generally informed, and they will be informed specifically on a on a block by block basis. Rob Cloninger is the superintendent, and he's already spending time with the businesses on the first block to talk to each of the merchants so they understand what's coming up with the sequencing of the project. Um, there will be a lot of disruption on a block-by-block -block basis. However, the businesses will remain open. The accesses will be both from the, uh, the alley entrances where the public parking lots are mostly along the seconds, and then also in front of the businesses all through construction will have compacted gravel lanes leading to the front doors of each of the businesses. So Rob will be working out the details with each of the business owners well in advance of construction so they understand what's coming up. Does that address your question? We have a couple of other comments. Did I answer your question, Chris? Suzanne Hawkins. Thank you. Kind of a follow-up to that. Um, last week we heard from one of our business owners that um, so many construction vehicles are parking in those back parking lots and near the alleys that it's basically closing the alley entrances now. And as we start working through this, that was a concern. Do we have a plan for where construction workers can park and stay out of the way of consumers? We do. There, um, the, the vehicles that are there now are for probably the um, the alleyway utility project, which is fairly limited in duration. Just the utilities that are necessary to serve the remodeled city hall are being done now. Um, and then, the, of course, the city hall project itself, which is separate from the project that I'm talking about. But GUHO has arranged, uh, we've leased space right nearby for construction trailers and for the contractors to park. So we will not be taking up any parking spaces for the public. And if any of the construction crews um, violate that, then they'll be reminded and asked to move their vehicles. GUHO will be right on top of that. Thank you very much. Ruth Pierce. So Chris, I wanted to mention that um, Nate Discuss at a URA meeting that he actually personally visited every business on Main Street and talked to them about the schedule. So there actually has been some reach out, but I know they're going to do some more. And I think that first block has been kind of kick everything off, and every all all the other blocks, uh, if they've had their head in the head in the sand, they will uh, no they longer will have their head in the sand. <laughs> yeah, a little bit overkill, but we want to make sure. sure. Okay. With regard to the flag display tradition, the Lions Club, uh, pictured here is Mr. Mervyn Mueller of the Monarch Twin Falls Lions Club. They've had a tradition of displaying the flags on eight holidays per year in front of participating businesses. Uh, those holidays have included Martin Luther King Day, President's Day, Memorial Day, Flag Day on June 14th, Independence Day, um, Labor Day, Columbus Day, and Veterans Day. So businesses who wish to participate pay a nominal fee of $35 per year. All of that money goes to the Lions Club, and they give all of that money, 100% of it, uh, to provide eyeglasses to people who can't otherwise afford eyeglasses. Um, we, at our company, CH2M, we think that's a very honorable program and a tradition that uh, we'd like to see continue. So. I've checked with our office manager, and we're willing to pay for the sleeves that would go in the sidewalks to continue the tradition um, in front of the businesses. Um, this is one example uh, in front of uh, a business on Main Avenue. Um, the flags, are, the poles are about 10 feet tall. It was a windy day, so we have a, a great display of the, the flag. and. Um, Again, the Lions Club takes care of this not only for Main Avenue but for other areas of downtown. And the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts also continue the tradition around other areas of Twin Falls. So the question right now is, uh, there, it's a technical one of where will the sleeves go because we have about 26 businesses who participate, dozens more who could. So do we put sleeves in front of every business? How do we... Uh, make it so that it's not a tripping hazard or unsightly in some way. So we're trying to work those details out right now with the design team and the construction team. 
Um, and then at, your, at a meeting a month from now, we'll present options for the URA board's consideration. And then if you like, I'll come back and, and give you their um, suggestion on how we can handle that. There's been a suggestion of having flags in limited areas and businesses contribute to that. There's been a suggestion of only having flags in front of the participating businesses, and there's also a suggestion that they be potentially in front of every business. So we need to get that figured out because construction is starting later this month. But what I'd like to request of City Council uh, this evening and what we ask the URA board is just for um, consensus that we should continue to pursue the, the technical option so that we don't have to have um, the Lions Club drilling holes in the sidewalks later on. We, we take care of it in, in advance. So is this a tradition that you would like to see continue? Thank you, and I yes. think it's very generous of you to offer the sleeves. Thank yes, you. Thank you. You're welcome. So that's I, would, the I would take that as general consensus head nodding amongst the councils. How could you go against the American flag? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if only you would have had a Boy Scout requested. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next is a presentation on the uh, revised enforcement response plan associated with the pretreatment program that is to be submitted to the Environmental Protection Agency for review and approval. We have Jason Brown. Welcome, it's Jason. It's a glamorous title, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Uh, before I get started, I'd, I'd been asked to uh, talk about a, uh, an award that uh, the engineering group got um, for an engineering and excellent award for the Cliff Bar pretreatment facility. I was able to go accept that today at, the, at a conference up in Boise on behalf of the, the URA and Twin Falls staff along with our design firm for that. And so uh, that was an opportunity that was good to, to show our <coughs> involvement in a, in a project with our community partners. So the enforcement response plan is the document in which helps us, guides us in uh, enforcing the, the federal and the city pretreatment standards here with our industrial partners. Um, and so what uh, the last time that we had actually revi revised the ERP was about 20 years ago. And so as things have changed and through some conversation, discussion with the Environmental Protection Agency, we've chosen to go through and revise this document. It helps us uh, and guides us in how we uh, interact with our industrial partners here in town. And so it's, it's a requirement of the pretreatment standards uh, as, a, as a, uh, an accepted pretreatment program, which the city of Twin Falls has. Um, we have to provide this document to, to the EPA for their review and approval of that. And so we're coming here to the council tonight to present this, get any feedback and comments from you at the uh, final, and then at a later date, come back and, and after the EPA has reviewed that and get your uh, approval for the, the overall program. And so tonight I've asked uh, CH2M, they're the uh, under contract to operate our pretreatment facility and they're really the ones that have put the effort into this document and the effort into this presentation. So I've asked our pretreatment coordinator, uh, Lance Nielsen, to come and present this to you and then any questions will be answered by committee. Uh, if, if needs be. So I'll go ahead and turn the time over to Lance and uh, we'll, we'll start with the presentation. Thank you, Jason. Good evening. I'm Lance Nielsen. Welcome. With CH2M. And we have a presentation with PowerPoint and hopefully it will work. <laughs> just went to sleep. Oh, you just need to, Sharon, can you flip the switch? And there we go. 
Thank you. Tonight, we're going to talk about the enforcement response plan and the new surcharge program that we hope to implement. So what the enforcement plan is, like Jason mentioned, is just outlines what the pretreatment personnel can do given a certain um, situations such as violations. Um, why do we need it? It is required by the EPA. It falls under the Clean Water Act and 40 CFR 403. So this is our current enforcement response plan. Um, like Jason said, it hasn't been updated since or in the last 20 years. This is the first revision of it. Um, the issue that we have with it now is that it, the wording of it's confusing and it doesn't allow for a lot of wiggle room for us to work with our industries in the area. <coughs> so with our current enforcement response plan, it has an enforcement guidance. So when a violation occurs, the industrial pretreatment coordinator is aware of it. He or she is able to make um, the, or determine the action that needs to happen with it. Um, if it can just um, happen with an informal notification, they can just go ahead and do that and document it. Um, other cases is that they have to compile the information and then send um, enforcement ac action to the control authority, which in this case is the city of Twin Falls. And once the city of Twin Falls decides what they want to do, they implement the enforcement action. So what we did, we took the last or the information from the last six years and compiled it into this graph from October 2010 to September 2016. We had um, 1,329 violations, both major and minor violations. Um, with this, this amount, 80% of them came from only two categories. Um, when the EPA sees this amount, they freak out a little bit. They're like, <laughs> okay, what's wrong with Twin Falls? <coughs> Are they not caring or what's wrong? So we are hoping or we are in, um, we are hoping to continue on or to improve the amount of violations that are reported and hopefully reduce the amount with our new um, enforcement response plan, plan and surcharge program. So the modifications that we are making to the enforcement plan so I'm going to interrupt you real quick. Chris is talking to us. Uh, could I just uh, go back to the sure. BOD and the suspended solids? Uh, why is EPA so surprised when we do food processing? Are they uh, not a major contributor to the Burley area food processing plants? I mean, are we that much of an anomaly in the enforcements? Well, th the reason that we are so high is because how often we test, how often we sample. A lot of the areas, they only sample one, two times a month more in some um, cases. Okay. So that's the reason why we're so high, even if we do have the food industry here. <coughs> Thank you. So like I was saying, the modifications we're making is um, relating to the structure and duties. The control authority will still be able to re um, review the samples and identify um, discharge violations. Um, they compile the enforcement actions and then send the notifications off to the industry that has that violation. Um, we are hoping to improve communication with this new enforcement response plan to make life better for the City of Twin Falls and the industries themselves. Um, once the control authority hears back from the industries, then they can decide, do we need to meet with them to decide the proper course of action or are we okay? Another, um, once that is done, we can um, review the history of the industry. We know our industry is pretty well in, here in Twin and how they operate and how willing they are to change. And then once we get a good baseline, we can decide what violations or what enforcement action we need to take. Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, Suzanne Hawkins. Sorry, before you get on. And I, I apologize if I misunderstood or 
missed what you were saying. This is what we're going to now. So what have we been doing before that's different than this? If these are the changes. Sorry. No, that's, that's perfectly fine. So what we currently do is we have a major minor uh, violation uh, situation. And in our current uh, realm, we don't have a lot of flexibility, and we haven't really specified exactly how we're going to handle some of those uh, issues and instances where um, a, a grayer area, if, if that's the way I can put it. And so what we've, what we've chosen to do is to, to classify them a little bit more um, distinctly. And, and so that's what these levels have gone to. So we want to make sure that we have much more front-end communication with our industries than what we've had in the past. And so this, this allows us to be able to talk to them, understand what the situations um, are, what's happening in their, in their facilities, more so than what we have now. It, it really, um, if you go over your permit limit now, we really don't have a choice to, to work with you. It, it is what it is. And, and we're trying to get away with that, or away from that at the EPA's request, as you can see back to uh, Councilman Talkington's um, comment before was we sample our industries every day. We have a, a huge uh, understanding, of, a big understanding of what um, our industries do to our, our, pre, our treatment facility, where uh, other communities, uh, they sample a little less frequently than we do, and even oftentimes the industries are required to sample themselves. And so we understand, and it's inherent in our program, that we're probably going to have more violations in our new program, mm -hmm. or in our, in our current program, and we're trying to get away from um, having to report the, the instant, instances that we don't even see. They're, they're a minute um, blip in the radar. Uh, and so that's really what we're trying to do, and the EPA has... has um, encourage us to go this way, that we are able to have a little bit more flexibility with our industries uh, under the new program, where we don't have under the, the current <coughs> program. So did that answer? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Uh-oh. I, I told you it Getting was the big guns answered, now. <laughs> answered by committee. Oh, no. Sean knows I won't let him go without <laughs> speaking. No, thank you, Mayor and Council, to be able to address this. Kind of one of the, the things, hopefully, that explains it a little bit different is in the permits that the industries have, they have limits for each item. So they have limits for BOD, for TSS, for flow. And in the old enforcement response plan, if they went over those any amount, that <laughs> caused us to give them a notice of violation. And that's going to be one of the big drastic changes in this is that working with EPA and re-looking at this, is those are able to be changed to what is more of a surcharge instead of a notice of violation, and that will actually bring that down. And as they mentioned before, I think the difference is when you're, when you're sampling that many times, uh, it gives you that many more opportunities to have those kind of violations where they can exceed it. And there are some industries that have very, very small amounts that they can discharge, say 25 pounds a day. So a tiny little bit that they may be over was going down as violations that we're adding towards this and causing that issue. And so as we've been talking with the EPA and they have given us kind of this guidance of here's an option that you may look at, I think that that benefits the industries where it doesn't look like black marks constantly, but it also gives another way of still uh, holding them to those limits that they have, which is basically kind of a capacity of the treatment plan so that they're just not going above that. Does that make sense, hopefully? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> That's why I brought them. <laughs> <laughs> so we break, broke it down to three levels of um, notification. So level one is kind of the area that we'll be mostly in. Um, it'll just be a corrective notice, an informal notice, um, just, hey, an email saying you're over the limit, what's going on, et cetera. Um, level two is a little bit more severe than that. Um, put them into SNC or significant non-compliance st um, status. SNC status has its own federal requirements. Um, if an industry, for example, discharges something and it passes through the, pre or the, the wastewater facility and into the environment, then that would um, violate 
their permit, our permit, and it would be bad all the way around. And so that would put them into an SNC um, status. With that would come increased fines and a um, compliance schedule. And then there's level three, which is the most severe of all three levels. Um, we are never want to be in there, so that would um, result in termination, um, service suspension, things of that nature. <coughs> Chris Reed. So with the historical data that you currently have in place, where would most of those fall? They would most of them would fall in the level one, or <coughs> even before that, just as um, Sean mentioned, that they're just little blips. That we don't even see them. So they wouldn't even fall on, on one of these levels? No. So under new, the new um, enforcement response plan, the control authority can identify and verify the non-compliant compliance events, um, evaluate for the significant non-compliance as um, the federal regulations um, demand, and then they can decide, and then they send out the notice to the industries and wait for a response back from them. And with that, the control authority has an option of either continuing on to escalated enforcement or to um, decide not to further um, uh, um, go after the enforcement action. In all circumstances, documentation, documentation um, does happen. So this slide um, goes in more detail of the last one. Um, just to iterate everything again, compliance authority will see it, they'll send off the notification, and then based on the reply, they'll determine the correct enforcement um, action. So <coughs> seeing how these three levels work, um, this is a table taken from the actual document of the enforcement response plan. On the left is just the type of compliance, um, and then middle is the specific nature of the violation, what happens, and then the enforcement response, um, what level it could correspond with. So then we get into our new surcharge program that we uh, um, want to, um, to get into to help reduce the amount of violations that we are getting. So the surcharge program will have two limits, a surcharge limit or threshold and a compliance limit. So the surcharge threshold will be at a specific um, limit, which is their permit times um, 1.4 uh, one, 1 of their um, permit limit, and then compliance is when they go over the 1.4 times their permit. So when they're going over their permit plus 40 extra percent. The surcharge will result in no violations while the um, compliance limit does result in the violation. <coughs> so these are the um, rates that apply to the surcharge program. The first column is just a simple 1 to 1.2 times their permit limit and 1.2, 1.4 their surcharge limit for the next one and then their enforcement limit is when they go um, above the compliance um, limit, and each one of those has a corresponding rate that goes with it. And then once they pass the 1.4 times the permit uh, or the compliance limit, we are required by um, uh, federal regulations to implement uh, administration fines. Um, so first day is 250. 500, second day, and then so on and so forth, until the fourth, and so on, is a thousand. And then also we talked about um, when they have consecutive days of surcharging, surcharging um, that should actually read four to five days <coughs> instead of three to five, but then it's a fine as well, and then when it's six or more consecutive days of surcharging, then they, it's a thousand dollar fine. Also when they are six or more days, they will be put into a significant non-compliance because by then they know that they have a problem and we can see it or feel it at the um, wastewater facility. And did those uh, fees go to the EPA or to? No, those fees are, those okay. fees are uh, put into, I believe the general fund, is that correct, Lori? Or wastewater in the wastewater fund. So okay. those, those are, 
those are the funds that go to the city themselves or to our to ourselves but uh, it is um, required by by federal law that we actually have a graduation a graduating um, escalation of, of fines as well um, so that is that that goes to the city and I so, gather there's no appellate process on this so we we uh, there is um, and that was part of the, some of the front end communication. If we've gotten to this point, we, we, have, we have some serious issues going on um, with the industries. Uh, they're, they're in a, a situation where they're violating uh, constantly. So the levels were really set up to help some of the front end communication and be able to get out of this point. Um, and so uh, that's where the communication part really comes in with the, with the industries and working with them. And we have and you'll see from some examples um, later in the presentation, and we've we have in the past, we've been able to work with our industries, and um, instead of us collecting the money directly, we've we've asked them to put it back into a into their facility to help them resolve the problem. Um, this is what we're trying to do: is is let them know, okay, we're we're following and implementing the rules, but if there's a way for us to help you not get to this point we're, we're willing <coughs> able and wanting to do that so that's but yeah those those go to the city thank you thanks Jason so this graph is a comparison of the violations that currently happen which are in purple and then a comparison of violations that would have occurred if we would have had a surcharge program six years ago which is the gray comparing the two there's a 60% Reduction. This is a huge amount. <coughs> Which makes everyone happy, makes us happy, makes the industries happy because they don't have to report their violations, and the EPA is happy in the end as well. So we have made three different um, surcharge case studies to show you how this works. Um, out of the original, or out of the 13,000 to an, or 20, wow, excuse me, out of the roughly the 1,300 violations that occur, did occur um, over the last six years, roughly 69% of them fall into this example. So this is just a minor permit exceedance. Um, they have a permit limit of 2,300. They exceeded um, with the actual discharge of 29,000 roughly, or 2,900. Um, under our current EAP um, enforcement response plan, it's about a $717 fine with a minor violation. With our proposed surcharge, it would be a $1,300 fine with no violation. The reason for the increase in fines is one, we are hoping to, or excuse me, we're encouraging our um, industries to stick to their permits, not to exceed them. And another one is when they discharge extra, they are taking up extra capacity at the facility. So that could so that limits others as well. <coughs> this is a major permit exceedance. This um, occurred 30% of the th um, roughly 1,300 violations. Um, you can see the numbers again, 2,300 for a permit limit and almost a 4,000 for actual discharge. This puts them over their compliance limit. So it's roughly a $2,000 fine with a major violation. Proposed surcharge is roughly 2600 with a um, violation. Now bad days do happen. Ooh, that's scary. <laughs> Don't worry. They do happen. Out of the 1300 that violations that we did see, this happened less than 1%. So these are really, really rare occasions. So they violated all of their um, permits. Um, this would be a $28,000 fine under our current one with a violation and proposed would be roughly a $79,000 um, fine with a violation. However, um, as Jason had mentioned earlier, that sometimes we can, can talk to the industry themselves and say, okay, you have this fine, but what happened? Did a machine break down or was there a lapse? And so you can take part of the fine and, uh, and put it into your own um, system, trying to update certain machinery or 
training or things of that nature. Again, I just want to express that this is a really rare occasion. And if I can here as well, um, so we understand that this it, it's a it's a large number, but we also in this particular situation it it's not an exact correlation to an event that happened uh, recently, but a, a very similar situation. And we actually saw an impact down at the treatment plant um, that that really could have um, put us into a situation. That was that what wasn't good for us. We we had a potential of, of seeing more TSS out of the back end of our treatment plant um, with the with the upgrade to the treatment facility, the IFAST system that we've done over the last couple of years, where we were able to to manage this a little bit better. Um, and again, it is it is less than one percent. And as Lance was saying, we really this this one is not to go out and and try to get money from the industries. These events really are caused. Uh, by specific uh, potential malfunctions in industry um, uh, pretreatment facilities or something that happened inside the facility that then they could use this money to go and fix and hopefully that these <coughs> events don't happen. And so um, it is a scary number. We had a lot of internal discussion about this number, but it is, it is a situation and scenario that, that can and has happened um, recently to, to us. Chris Dawkins. Uh, Jason, this is a little bit off track. We've been primarily addressing suspended solids and BOD, mm -hmm. but with our settlement ponds, which uh, I think I'm correct, the primary purpose is to improve the water quality by further uh, removal of phosphorus mm -hmm. before it uh, percolates back into the water, through the water table into the snake. Mm -hmm. We have no process for receiving credits, attaboys, anything positive for that. Is that my understanding? The EPA is so befuddled that they don't know how to handle it? Uh, it, it is. Uh, the phosphorus issue is something that isn't in our current uh, enforcement response plan. The, the new enforcement response plan allows us to, if, it, if we get to that point with the EPA, um, we actually have a meeting tomorrow with the, uh, with the EPA and the local uh, water advisory group. Uh, here in town, uh, since since some of our last meetings, there hasn't been a lot of updates. The EPA wants to come back and, and present their uh, presentation to a larger group of people, and so. But under the current uh, reality, there there aren't opportunities for attaboys. And well, it looks like they're afraid to move out of their comfort zone. Excuse me for being a little bit uh, brusque on this, but they want to hold us accountable, rightfully so. Yep. But our, our upgrade in our water system, we're, we're providing almost tertiary quality water to the Snake River. Mm -hmm. The phosphorus, <coughs> phosphorus is just another addition that through our innovation, our cost to the taxpayers, mm -hmm. we're providing additional water quality. Uh, it just seems that they are uh, uh, only interested in looking at the negative. And, and uh, we've, we, through our conversations, with the EPA, we have tried to point out just that in the sense of, hey, we have, we have tried to implement uh, newer technology, uh, technology that helps us and the water body itself, the Snake River, um, improve. And so that has been, that has been a, uh, a sounding board for us from the city and city staff in those conversations that we have tried and we are, we are um, on the forefront trying to move forward for better water quality. Um, well, I appreciate in, that, in that Jason. I'd sure like to be kept in the loop on how that discussion okay. goes. Yep, we'll uh, we'll have that conversation tomorrow and then and update as as uh, as needed through that. But um, and we feel that this program it was time um, to to look at the enforcement response plan uh, because time had changed, the regulatory environment had changed in such a way that we we want to continue to improve. Our relationship with our industries but also improve our water quality we have the benefit of having the upgrades to the treatment plan we have our treatment plant we have some flexibility there and and, and we really believe that this we're on the right path of, of what we're doing and then also uh, the EPA has really encouraged us to to look at, at changing our, our pretreatment program along this process um, the, the word violation obviously has a has a certain meaning uh, in the in the environmental regulatory world, and uh, any chance that we can get away from using that specific uh, language 
we, we definitely are trying to get there. And that, I believe that is that is the end of, of the uh, presentation. So if there's any further comments or, or concerns or questions, we would we'd take those at this time. So a question I have is, uh, so obviously you've had these conversations with our industry partners. And, we have. And their um, understanding mm -hmm. of the process and we, we is, have. Is supportive a, a good enough word? Or is they were, actually. They were very supportive of we, um, let's see, two weeks ago we had a meeting with roughly four of the, the industrial partners, and then last week on Wednesday we had the remaining remainder, except for one was unable to attend. Uh, we've sent the documentation to all of the industrial users. There were good comments. One of the, one of the eyebrows that raised was on that last surcharging uh, slide. Obviously, that is we, we are aware that that is a large sum of money, um, and so we went back through our documentation to look: is there an ability to um, be a little bit more flexible in those types of situations? And so we looked back through the document, and we believe that it gives us the flexibility to work with the industries to to not accept that money in house, but also you know go back use and, it to correct yeah, the problem. Use, use it to correct the problem, and we've done that. Uh, since I've been with the city, and I know we've done that uh, before I came to the city, and so they, you know, this helps us document that process. But they were supportive because violations uh, internally to them caused them um, some issues as well. Right. Uh, and so that, again, that that word of violation really holds a, a specific meaning inside the, the environmental regulatory world. So, thank you. Any other comments or questions from the? Council? I think we all have a very thorough understanding of all the technical. <laughs> <laughs> Much better than we did. That's, yeah, it, uh, it, you know, these processes actually help you gain a lot more information and understand the program a little bit more. But so the next step for us really is, is to submit this for comments to, to the EPA. They have the opportunity to then, then you know, comment. On that, if we don't receive comments uh, for 90 days from them, then by law, it's they they've basically approved the changes. So I imagine we'll have some comments and we'll go back and forth, and then at, at, at a later date come back and give an update and then an approval for that uh, specific adoption of the the new enforcement response plan. Great, thank you. Thank you. Next is a presentation of an update on the winter road damage and request to use uh, street reserves to repair a portion of the winter road damage. We have John Caton, Public Works Director. Welcome, John. Good evening, Mayor and Council. One second here. Thank you. Um, tonight, I asked the uh, the street superintendent and street supervisor to be here tonight. Mark Thompson, the street supervisor, is going to uh, give the beginning part of this report. And really, our, our point tonight is to give you an update on what the winter. We all know we had a tough winter. Want to give you an update on um, the toll it took on on the roads and what we plan to do with it. So, with that, I'll let Mark go ahead and get started. Thanks, John. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I appreciate you giving us the opportunity to come before you tonight. Um, my part of this uh, PowerPoint is kind of just the first two bullets. Uh, most of you have been uh, a pretty, uh, have a pretty good understanding of our zone maintenance program. Um, so I'm going to give you just a, <coughs> another brief overview, overview and then just a little refresher on uh, the pavement condition index, which we call PCI. And then an existing pavement condition um, survey that we took from uh, TransMap in the fall of 2015. So what is our zone maintenance? Um, zone maintenance is a preventative maintenance program that focuses <coughs> on um, utility maintenance, pavement preservation, and accessibility. 
it accounts for uh, 40 percent of our annual budget between uh, streets, sewer, and, and water. Uh, we have eight um, individual uh, zones that we have broken the city up into that um, they encompass 78 lane miles. And each year um, we focus all our efforts in that one zone. And it, we may not focus, streets may not focus one in one area, water may focus in another area. Just um, we prefer to have water out in front of us um, because it's easier for them to get uh, the underground utilities done before we come and then pave over the top of it. <coughs> so our, our zone maintenance goals uh, are very, our top goal in our zone maintenance program is, is to preserve our roadways and our, and our infrastructure uh, to provide a safe, accessible community for our citizens. Um, it allows the public works and engineering to collaborate our, our projects. And we can sequence the work um, efficiently, and we can co coordinate the planning uh, a little bit easier. Uh, we can perform the underground maintenance um, prior to our surface repairs. Um, we can do the proper uh, surface treatment over an entire zone. One of our other goals is to overlay one lane mile. Uh, between overlays and mill and inlays, um, we would try and replace one mile of sewer and water main. And then we, we follow in behind our seal coat with the sewer manhole re rehabilitation, which is most of you know Mr. Mr. Manhole. manhole. Mr. Manhole. Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and then we try and, after an overlay, we try and go back at least a year later and do some type of a surface treatment on that overlay. Uh, this just kind of shows um, our Zone 5 seal coat that we'll, we will be starting this um, summer. And this uh, shows the different surface treatments that we're going to be doing in different areas. It, it lists the, the chip seal, slurry seal, and fog seal. And then when we talk about pavement condition index, um, it's a scale of 0 to 100. Um, our a brand new road is basically a hundred. Um, anything once you start dropping off the scale, uh, the lower the number goes, the less your pavement's going to survive. So anything below twenty is basically um, in very poor condition. Zero is completely failed, and all of these um, distresses are how we come up with the pavement condition index. Each each different um, distress is measured, and then a certain um, number is given to those, and then it takes an average of all those numbers. I was going to throw in the formula but, I, formula, but I couldn't even understand the majority <laughs> of it. The computer does the most of it. Um, so all these different dis uh, distresses go into forming our pavement condition index. Uh, these are just <coughs> examples of, of some rutting. Um, these are pretty high severity ruts, um, and if you look by his right foot, you can also see where the pavement's actually started to shove uh, into that other wheel track. The picture on the right is what we don't want. We don't want ruts filled with water. Eventually, those are going to fail. This just shows some different um, severities of block cracking. Uh, block cracking is usually um, climate related. On the left is some uh, pretty high severity block cracking. Um, the one on the right is, is low to medium. And when we do a pavement survey, um, the, if those lines don't connect into blocks, they have to be measured out individually. Uh, so it's very time consuming when we do our um, surveys. This one pretty much <coughs> pretty easy one to figure out. Alligator <laughs> cracking. That's where your pothole is going to be. We've got a few of those around town right now. Yeah, North Elf. <laughs> yes, that's a bad one. So in the fall of 2015, uh, we um, had a company uh, named Transmap come in. Um, in two weeks, they did what we couldn't do in two years. Um, they drove every city street, and at the end of the uh, at the end of their project, 
they were able to give us a PCI number on every single street in the city. Wow. So we can use this map now to help guide uh, <coughs> our surface treatments and where we um, plan to do our work in the future. Uh, the picture on the left is from our uh, Zone 2 fog seal. Um, that particular street had a PCI number of 82, um, so we went with a lesser treatment on a fog seal. The picture on the right is from our Zone 3 seal coat, which that piece of Washington had a PCI of 74, so we ended up doing a little bit heavier treatment and gone with, went with the seal coat. This is where John gets to take over. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, just to add on to what Mark um, was talking about with the PCI, um, you know, he can explain it in way better detail um, because he's actually done it. He actually gets out in the field and he's, and he's taken uh, pavement condition um, um, measurements and when he says measurements, he means that we actually go out, grab a sample, you count the cracks, you measure the depth, you measure the width, all that. And you can imagine how long it takes. You don't need to do 100% of the city. You do need a representative sample. But even doing a representative sample takes a lot of, a lot of effort. And so the, when he said they drove it, they used a LIDAR, laser, radar, a bunch of other stuff to drive it at, at the speed limit. And they can pick up thousands, tens of thousands of data points per second. Um, and the whole idea is to um, measure measure our um, existing life of pavement, which is what this slide's a little bit about. So, like Mark said, on the <clears throat> on the left hand side of this chart, we have p uh, pavement condition: hundred being brand new, zero, zero being completely failed, and then you got life in years, time. 0, 5, 10, 15, 20. And this is specifically for asphalt pavement, which ha generally has a design life of 20 years. And so I think I've showed this chart to you guys before, and then you might be wondering, why am I showing you this? I, I was teasing Mark. I said, this is probably the most important slide because um, I think it's what helped me convince Lori to spend some money. <laughs> um, <laughs> but... But really, um, what we got going on here is this, this curve here describes the life of pavement. If you don't do anything, no, any maintenance at all, th this is what happens. It'll just it'll deteriorate over time. And you can see that it, hol it holds its life pretty, pretty good, and then it reaches what we call the critical PCI. And it, it's the point of no return. And right there, it turns into a gentle slope, from, from a gentle slope into a steep cliff. Um, the whole idea is um, to, to <clears throat> this was created by the Army Corps of Engineers, the pavement preservation philosophy, and, and basically for, I don't know how long, 50, 60 years, the Army Corps of Engineers has, has, um, has basically revolutionized the pavement preservation program um, through studying. Uh, it's all empirical. Um, you know there's some theory, but a lot of it is, is tried and tested. And basically what they, they've shown is that um, the best way, the smartest and best way to spend your money is as shown. A, as life starts to go away and you do a chip seal, let's say, or a fog seal or a slurry seal, it's, you come to here and um, it's, like, it's like a volleyball bounce. You get, just got to keep the volleyball up in the air. That's the way they explain it. And basically the condition improves from a seal coat. It deteriorates over time. You do another seal coat, and you can see it extends extends the life. The thing is, is when you do surface treatment like um, fog, chip, um, slurry, you want to do it before you hit your critical PCI. Um, because well, here's here's the main reason: for every dollar you spend up here, um, <coughs> if you miss your critical PCI and you're down here, you're in, you're starting to get into mill and overlay, and you're or reconstruct, which can range anywhere from $15 to 60, 60 times this amount here. Um, so um, we have, thanks to council support, what I would call uh, a robust and good seal coat program, going back to zone maintenance. 
um, were able to seal coat or provide a surface treatment, I should say, for almost 100% of every zone as we go in. So seal coat, I think, I think we're pretty much there. Where we're, where we're lacking a little bit in funds, but we've gotten better over time, is in the mill and inlay and reconstruct. Um, and now I can probably talk about what happened this winter. First of all, actually, is there any questions on this slide? It's back to the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Yes, yeah. So I created, so every, every, um, every climate, every region is going to have different experience. This is our actual experience. This is what we spent on our pavement rehabilitation. So the first thing you see, I just want to walk you through this chart. So the first thing you see is fog seal, PCI condition. So this is the pavement rehab type. Fog seal, you're going to, you're, you, it's pretty light to stress. It's fairly new pavement. And what you're doing is you're rejuvenating the oil. You're adding life to the oil. And so your PCI scores will be pretty high. Um, you're going to add three to five years to that. This is a unit cost. And then I, then I converted it to um, a life cycle cost. And I converted it to one. I'll just explain later. So the next, the next. Uh, Theor theoretically, though, John, every three to five years, you could do that fog seal and and bump it back up for another in inde yes. indefinitely. Well, what happens actually, and it's not illustrated in that picture very well, is every time you bounce that volleyball up, it doesn't quite go as high. Okay. So it does. There's yeah, there's diminished diminished return. Okay, so the next level is slurry seal. Again, you can see the the PCI. You can go a little bit worse. Um, roadway, you get a little bit more life. Slurry seal is basically an oil with with a, um, a small particle. Like, um, what's, what size are the particles? Are they? You probably don't care. <laughs> small particles. I'm so Big, bigger than a molecule, but smaller than a bread box. How's that? No, I'm going to go get one. I'll be right back. <laughs> so slurry is light, though. It's not the chip seal. What my point is, is it's not the chip seal that, that aggravates people. Um, you're going to get five to eight years. Here's the unit cost. Chip seal is a little bit more. You get a decent amount of uh, life out of a chip seal. Um, you can see, and I want to spend a minute on this, we try not to put chip seal just anywhere. We um, put it in arterials and collectors, places that high, have higher, more robust traffic. We try to avoid the bike lane. If a roadway has a bike lane on it, <clears throat> we either will leave chip off or we'll maybe use a different surface treatment for the entire road. Harrison's what I have in mind this past year. Um, and I just want to point out that um, <coughs> You can see chip seal and slurry. slurry. Why, well, why would we use chip over slurry? Um, it's because it's cost less. You get you get more life out of it. It is a better product. It does cause complaints. So you got there is a balance there. So we're trying to balance that by not using it everywhere. Overlay, overlay is when you you, you know we use that on mostly collectors or or, or grader. You're going to mill out some pavement and you're going to put back a couple inches of of plant mix. You get ten to 10 to 15 years on that, um, that's probably, 15 is pretty high, it's probably 10 to 12. Um, and I don't need to go through all these, but then reconstruct, of course, you're going to have a really low PCI, you're going to get 20 years, it's extremely expensive. And th this last column is really the most important. So fog seal, you're going to spend a dollar, and here, when we have to reconstruct, we're going to spend 34 times as much. Um, so it's really important for us to to uh, to take care of our pavement and keep investing it all <coughs> wisely and spend it right here and leverage every dollar we can. Any questions on this? Okay, so now I'll just talk about what our experience was this winter, and I know it's been a, a long council meeting, uh, so I'll try to try to be brief here. Um, 
what, what you see here is um, Mark actually personally went out and um, he, he's inventory blowouts. And so we've experienced potholes, which are going to be pretty small localized. You know what they are, potholes. And then these are not potholes. These are bigger. They're, they're blowouts, we call them. And basically what you got here is a freeze-thaw. The frost is coming out of the ground. In some cases, you saw the ground rise 6 to 12 inches out of the ground, and it settles back down, and there's absolutely nothing nothing left of the pavement. So there's over 40 locations. <laughs> there's, there's over 40 locations um, that were significant blowouts. Um, you don't see, I don't think, any potholes on here. So this doesn't capture the whole picture, but it captures um, parts that are the most significant damage. So this year, Mark and Dean plan on dealing with the potholes within their existing budget. Um, and actually, most or some of these blowouts can be dealt with their existing budget. But many of these can't be dealt with. And you see these long, these long red lines. Are, these are larger construction projects. They're just total reconstructs, which leads us to our proposed project list. Yeah, that's an actual layout of those potholes that would kind of indicate we had some designer construction deficiencies that have them loaded in that end of town there, northeast quadrant. Yeah, a lot of those are, yeah, residential roads. Some of them are old county roads. Um, so, yeah, I was not surprised to see the failures there. Okay, um, let me back up. Before I get into to projects, um, Dean's budget this year has been <coughs> impacted, his ops budget. And so this is a quick update. So he, he printed this update on March um, 7th, and he's showing um, how much he spent on overtime, so he budgets eighteen thousand. He spent fifteen thousand six hundred um, as of March. Um, the snow, ice control materials only. Salt, liquid, deicer. Um, you can see he budgets ten. He spent twenty-two. Um, fuel costs. These are the big ones. And there's other categories, but you can see he spent um, over half of his budget by March. Yeah. Okay, so this project list um, is above and beyond those cones that you saw on that map, which I said, you know, there's some, there's some on here, but some are not. Um, but these are the projects that we've gone through and we've prioritized. It doesn't get every single everything, but but um, the way I have these divided is the the top one, two, three, four are complete reconstructs. The next grouping is a, a mill and inlay, and the I added a contingency to those for each of 15%, and so the rebuild cost is $2 million, the mill and inlay cost is $2.3 million, total $4.375 million. Um, I do need to talk to you about this, this workload. This, this, is a, this is a big workload, unanticipated workload. Contractors all over the state are scrambling to to do this. So there's a lot of a lot of ifs. You know, um, first of all, if you guys approve the the dollars to be to be funded, um, we have to in some cases design the projects. Um, some of them don't require very much design; they just require a public bidding. Um, but there is a process where an engineer will be involved. Um, and I have collaborated with engineering; they're they're ready to support um, whatever we can we can get done this this summer. I, I won't be surprised if, if, um, if because of schedule conflict or contractor availability that we don't get everything done on this list. Uh, but these are our priorities. Um, and there actually are two more projects. I, I put on here, if you remember, la last year we came back and asked to mill and inlay the rest of falls from um, Washington to um, Blue Lakes. And we, in order to do that, we need to do the south side to 88 ramps. We just, we just have to do that. So I plugged in with a number there. Um, as an example, each one of these projects is going to have a, an unknown. Uh, th that one, this Falls Avenue, 88 ramps, when we get out there and we start sizing the scope of every single 88 ramp, um, it might include aprons. It could include valley gutters. Wh wherever best we, 
you know, engineering uses their judgment. If we can salvage a, compo a component, we will. It minimizes cost. When it's not appropriate to salvage something that's already, you know, it's gone, we won't do it. So I, I expect that there's going to be some unknowns in each one of these categories. Um, that's why I've added 15% contingency. John Suzanne yes. Hawkins has a comment or question. Hi, John. Hi. So last year when we were talking about Frontier Road, where it connects to Falls Avenue by the um, fire station, mm -hmm. I thought we learned that that road belongs to CSI and not the city. We, we have Frontier on here. You see that? It's a mm -hmm. big number. Mm -hmm. And I actually have uh, – I'm glad you asked. I actually have the maintenance agreement, and it looks like we have maintenance. But I do want to, before we spend eight hundred thousand, I wanted to ask Fritz to to give a formal opinion on that, and I, he hasn't had a chance to do that yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. It's a little one, but that C three parking lot. Are you sure we have to put a penny into that dang thing? We may be getting rid of that. I see heads I, nodding. Okay. It's ours and not the URAs? I thought that belonged to the URA. Okay. Jackie's saying for maintenance purposes, it's ours. Hmm. <clears throat> so oh. the deferred uh, projects on there? Oh, yeah. Did you want to address those? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, Getting ahead of myself. So on these deferred projects, we know we have an issue with Locust, and we know we have uh, issues with Madrona and Addison. Uh, because they either are arterials or behave like uh, a major collector, they're going to require a, a significant design. Right now, um, Engineering Jackie has a contract. Um, it was in place before this winter to, uh, to do a material study of Locust so we can size that job. Um, so what I wanted to point out here is that, you know, all these projects we've prioritized, they don't get all of our backlog, obviously. These are big projects that need to happen, and we, we have problems on them right now. So you're going to see some spot repairs on Madrona, Addison, and Locust. Dean's going to have to work his magic. Dean and Mark are going to have to work his ma their magic on, on those streets, meaning they're going to have to zip and inlay when they have failures and, and just in, and limp through it until we can... Um, one, find funding, and two, get, get it designed. They're doing a great job, though. Okay, so project requirements. Um, obviously, when it comes to reserves, you can't, I mean, there's no more, there's no more to, I can't exceed budget uh, uh, in this, in this, uh, for this project. And um, I'm not worried about exceeding budget. I talked to you about unknowns. Um, we have contingency, but also we're going to phase the projects in a way that we spend. Our, I mean, we're going to construct as we go, and um, if we get close to the budget limit, we just we stop letting contracts. So that is zero concern to me. Um, again, we need to be mindful of pavement preservation philosophy. We need to invest correctly. Um, We'll be doing uh, thorough preliminary engineering to identify as many as unknowns as possible. Again, we'll be constructing in phases, and um, that's that's really it. Um, and that's it. If you have any questions, I'm sure I left some out. You want some money? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Comes out of your budget. <laughs> Um, so, so I took these projects to Lori and Travis, and um, we talked about um, what we could do with reserves. And um, J Lori has um, has explained to me that if we have um, $488,000 set aside in streets reserves as three months operating. And then on top of that $488,000, we set aside $700,000 for Canyon Springs road reconstruction next year. I need to talk to you more about that. And then another million dollars for unknown emergencies. Um, 
And then if I take the, re the remainder of reserves, which is about 4.4 million, um, that 4.4 that, that could be used to fund projects. And if you saw, I sized it right up to four, almost 4.4, it's 4.375. Um, on Canyon Springs, the long-term planning group hasn't done the presentation yet, of course, but we've been we've been in conversation, talking about the uh, Canyon Springs roadway, the side slope, and the trail. Um, one of the one of the casualties, if you will, will be you know there's only, there's only so much money, and um, seven hundred thousand dollars is being set aside in the street fund to reconstruct the roadway, and uh, and a million dollars is already um, uh, being used from the wastewater bond. So 1.7 can be used for the, the road reconstruction and um, the um, slope stabilization, but that's it. So the trail would not be funded. It was estimated an excess of $4 million. Uh, there's simply no funding um, unless we didn't, didn't do this. So, <clears throat> thanks for the reminder. It is what it is. Yeah. Greg Lanting. Travis and Lori, uh, I know there was a lot of posturing in the legislature this last year. Oh, thank you. <laughs> posturing this last year about additional funds. Uh, I know that there's the possibility of receiving some funds from, if there's excess money, but if he signs or allows to come in to be the repeal the grocery tax that will certainly cut into any excess funding there might be and there was another transportation bill in there uh, when would we receive those funds if we receive anything and what what is your confidence level we're going to receive anything I have um, so I'm not going to give you my thoughts on it I'm just going to kind of maybe lay out the, the timeline because I think that the process is yet to be defined by the legislature. Um, I think that if the governor obviously signs the grocery tax, that additional surplus eliminator, which would be then split between the cities and the state to fund road constructions, that amount of money um, becomes into question about how much of that surplus is available. Now, I believe that that is programmed to go beyond just this fiscal year, and there's other future opportunities, and the state continues to grow at a pretty uh, strong pace. There's the Garvey piece that the governor has yet to sign as well, and that would not necessarily improve any of these projects that, that you're looking at right here. There's a third piece of legislation that the legislature passed, I believe, that had to do with the emergency uh, winter repair and that's a third bill that's outside of the process um, the, the legislature appropriated the money my understanding is the money is available now um, but there is going to be a process and they have to set up a committee that is composed of city representatives county representatives it's going to be overseen by the state's uh, Bureau of uh, Disaster Services and there is some question about the declaration that was prepared by each county and whether or not individuals are going to be eligible uh, for um, moving forward. So there may be an opportunity there. What I would say is um, what John illustrated was about $4.3 million of critical need today. In fact, if, if the city had additional reserves, you saw the deferred maintenance piece of upwards of $12 million. Um, <coughs> what's important about that deferred maintenance piece is it's not going to go away. Um, in fact, what's going to happen is it is going to get worse um, each year um, as, as it continues to sit unmaintained. So if we receive additional funds from the legislature, we have the opportunities to fill and plug in those opportunities. If not, we'll have to use um, cash as it comes in to be able to fund uh, projects and, and chip away um, at those pieces of deferred maintenance as, as we move forward. Um, unfortunately, and I think that John and Mark did a great job, this winter uh, really kind of exposed our roads and, and our systems 
And while we have a great system in place now and the council has really risen to the uh, level of providing additional funding for road maintenance and building an eight-year program, part of this is uh, the sins of our past, um, recognizing that maybe we as a community and as an organization didn't uh, invest in our roadways the way that we should or as we accepted additional roads from the county there those upgrades and processes didn't necessarily materialize so um, I think that you're going to see this the other thing that John has shared with us um, and our in and, and members of the city staff is that this is just what you see today and the the potential full impact of what a cause below the surface may not be seen for even a few more years out I would just add to your your question of prognosticating what the legislature did or didn't do. Um, so the bills still have to get signed or allowed to become law. But secondly, we're not the only community in the state that dealt with this. And so while it may be additional funds coming from the state, um, how they're going to get carved up around the state, I know, has been a, a level of debate. You know, discussion of perhaps it's a competitive grant process it's not just allocated on a formulaic basis um, and I think that as as good as we've been about um, trying to keep up with maintenance lately I would suspect that some of our other cities in the state maybe have not done that and probably have greater damage than than we do thank you Sean. Mm -hmm. Chris Dockington I'm ready to make a motion. I just don't see that we have any choice. We barely have our head above water because of this bad winter. We've <clears throat> got that big deferred amount that uh, we don't even know how it's going to be paid for. I would so move the use of up to $4.4 million in reserve funds for this year's uh, road maintenance, reconstruction, repair, as described. Second. Motion by Chris Tockington, seconded by Greg Lanting to authorize the use of up to 4.4 million dollars of street reserve funds for the projects outlined is there a discussion I just want to say to John and certainly to your team I think that the work that you've done in trying to patch up the mess that's out there now is admirable um, but I appreciate that it's temporary um, I tend to drive locust a lot because it's a handy way to get from my office to downtown um, and that was certainly a challenge this winter um, and there are some there are some fairly smooth spots now um, <laughs> but I don't I don't suspect they're gonna hold when everybody keeps driving on them so again I think you all did an admirable job of trying to keep up with the damage that we had and uh, hopefully this can help uh, fix some of those so that you're not playing patch up on more and more miles of road thank you is there any further discussion Sharon, roll call vote, please. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Chris Hawkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Christopher Reed? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Thank you. Get the bids out now. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> can you uh, kind of give us a periodic update on how the progress is going? Sure can. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> And uh, next is a request to approve the Zone 7 water line replacement project to uh, Mesquite Incorporated in the amount of $242,505. John Cate. Thank you, Mayor and Council. You are spending an awful lot of money tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so this, was, this one was planned. <laughs> so, uh, so much for planning. <laughs> if, you remember, if you remember, Mark Thompson was saying we're going to be in Zone 5. He was talking about the surface treatment this year, and so you're going to see we're talking about Zone 7 today, and that's because we're doing utility work in the area of Filer Avenue um, from Madrona to Sunrise. Um, we're going to be replacing a water line. Um, we publicly bid this in March. We had uh, um, two bidders. Uh, the low bidder is Mesquite Inc. They're a local contractor. Um, and just to keep council posted, I, I'm going to propose a, a change order to this contract. Um, since you've um, approved the use of funds to replace winter damage, this project actually lands in one of the, the projects of uh, Filer that's completely, you know, falling apart. And so um, the, the asphalt paving portion of this 
would be of this project, 242,000 included a trench patch, but instead of doing a trench patch, we're going to repair like we should the whole lip to lip, um, the full width of the street. So um, I need to, I've talked to Fritz, I need to award the contract as it was bid in the amount of 242000 and um, and before I were to uh, authorize a, a change order to change order work out, which is approximately $30,000 um, if, if council approves. So at this time, I just, I stand for questions and request uh, council's approval for this contract. Any questions for John? Suzanne Hawkins. Not a question, but a motion if you're ready. Sounds good. I uh, move that we approve the request to award the 2017 Zone 7 bid to Mesquite Incorporated for $242,505. And after the bid is accepted, then to go ahead with the change order as needed. Second. Motion by Suzanne Hawkins, seconded by Ruth Pierce to approve the request as presented. Is there any discussion? Sharon, roll call vote, please. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Barriker? Yes. Chris Hawkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Christopher Reed? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Thank you. Thank you, John. Next, uh, another opportunity for public input. If there's anyone here from the public wishing to address the council on any issues, now is your opportunity to come forward. Seeing no one, uh, items from the city manager. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, we'll, I'll keep this brief. There are four quick items for your calendar. Number one, obviously, the state of the city begins at 1130. Um, after the presentation and a, and a quick Q&A, there's an opportunity to grab lunch at one of the um, uh, participating restaurants, and then we will jump over to do the official groundbreaking uh, with the Urban Renewal Agency. Um, I believe that's starting at about 1 o'clock. So, so it will be at the state of the city, then the ground playing, groundbreaking yeah, and then lunch. thing, and then you can go enjoy lunch. Right on your own through the end of April. Very good. <laughs> um, so this week, Phil Cushlin's in town, and he and I have been going around and speaking with several of our partnering uh, agencies and groups about the strategic plan and update really, really good conversations. Um, we hope to present um, kind of a what we heard um, response from all the different groups that we're talking about in May. We'll use that as a springboard to uh, have a final strategic plan uh, for the community's review uh, in in the fall. But I just wanted to let you know we're progressing with that. Um, this week, also on Thursday, is the city-county meeting in Murtaugh. Um If you're going to that, please, I, I think, contact um, the county to uh, RSVP. And then next Monday, we're going to have an early start um, at 3.30. We'll, we're asking you to, to come in um, so that we can then take a tour of the public safety complex as well as um, the city hall project. All right, Chris Hawkinson. Just to carry on with the ceremonies, uh, the airport terminal is nearly done. They're on the final punch list, and that open house will be at 10 o'clock uh, April 19th with a city council sneak preview most of an hour before, 9.15. That's uh, Tuesday, I think, isn't it? Pretty sure. Yeah. Yes, and some please. good news. Uh, yeah, we've had a hellacious winter, but uh, we have had 180 additional diversion flights from Sun Valley. And every time one of those planes tips down, the landing fees ring the till. He has a lot of good money. So <laughs> you can either pray for more snow next winter or say we had our, our good luck. But uh, that is real good news. <clears throat> well, I will say one of the other bonuses of the the winter weather is certainly the amount of traffic we're seeing down at Shosholm Falls, and it's certainly spreading around town. We had a good weekend at the visitor center last weekend, and I know their businesses in town seem pleased with the number of visitors coming to spend a little time and money. Greg Land. No, just quickly, I, I, my apologies. I won't be able to be at the airport dedication. Uh, I will fly out that morning at 6.30. <laughs> I'll be in the airport that day. I just will be leaving that day. So you get to use. My apologies. <laughs> That's even better. Anything else from Council? 
All right, with that, meeting is adjourned. Boy, we barely got going.